This video is a super cut of a series one of our usual editors, The Flying Buttress, makes on his own channel. This one being a retelling of the Tides of Darkness novel. So, before I let him talk, I've got to warn you, this video will have some swear words and mature humor. Roommates, how's it going? As Hiro just said, this is an adaptation of the Tides of Darkness novel by Aaron Rosenberg. It's definitely got some swears in it, but I wouldn't exactly describe my sense of humor as mature. Feel free to leave a comment letting Hiro know what you think. If you like this, there will certainly be more videos like it on Hiro's channel in future. Let's go! It was nearly dawn, and was very foggy. The sun hadn't quite risen yet, but in the sleepy village of South Shore, the villagers stirred. For it was a simple fishing village, so the people were already up, preparing to do fishing and stuff. However, as the villagers peered out from the dock towards the dark shrouded ocean, they began to hear something. A slow and steady sound reverberating in the air growing louder and louder, and it was ever so slightly spooky. And if that wasn't bad enough, the fog itself then began to swell and shift, with strange shapes moving within it, until finally, those shapes breached the fog and revealed themselves to be boats. A buttload of boats. The fisher folk relaxed a little bit. They knew boats. They bloody loved boats. But they were still a little bit wary, because this was a lot of boats. And since they were simple fishing folk from a simple fishing village, They'd probably only ever seen about two dozen boats in their entire lives. Some of the South Shore men decided now was probably a good time to grab some weapons. Planks of wood, knives, fishing nets, whatever came to hand really. And they watched tensely as the thousands upon thousands of boats appeared on the horizon and drew closer and closer. The first boat then beached itself and only now could the villagers see the figures within it and their sphincters relaxed once again. These weren't monsters, they were men and women and even children, and they didn't seem armed for battle either. This was no invasion. In fact, it became pretty apparent pretty quickly that these were refugees, fleeing from some horrible disaster, and the villagers of South Shore felt their fear turn to sympathy immediately. More boats reached the shore, with more distraught, thin and weak people pouring off of them. Many of them were so overwrought they could barely stand, but a few were soldiers, and one of them, an important looking one, stepped forward and approached the assembled villagers along with an older man in tattered robes and a third figure, a youth, dressed in richly made clothes and yet somehow looking the worst of the three. Hail and well met. We are refugees. I beg you, any food and drink you can spare and shelter if you can, for the children's sake. The villagers all looked at each other and then nodded and lowered their weapons. They weren't a wealthy village, but they weren't dicks either. So the South Shore men and women got to work, stirring up pots of porridge and stew and rounding up blankets and coats and stuff. Thank you. I know you can't spare much, but I'm grateful for what you've given us. We will not let women and children suffer. Marcus Redpath, I'm the headman of this village. Now tell me, who are you, and why are you here? My name is Anduin Lothar. I am, I was, the night champion of Stormwind. Stormwind? That's a ways away. Yeah, we sailed for days to reach this land. We are in Lordaeron, are we not? We are. I recognize the land, but not this village. This is South Shore. You're from Dalaran, are you not? Aye. And rest assured, I'll be returning there as soon as my companions can travel. Marcus tried not to let his relief show. Wizards were powerful. He'd heard the king treated them as allies and advisors, but he wanted no truck with magic. We shouldn't delay. I must speak with the king at once. We dare not give the Horde time to move again. Well, I have no idea what the Horde is, but your women and children may stay here a time. We'll take care of them. Thanks. We'll send food and other supplies back once we reach the king. It's going to take you a while to reach Capital City, though. I'll send someone ahead on a fast horse to warn them of your approach. What would you have them say? Lothar frowned. Tell the king that Stormwind has fallen. The prince is here, as are as many of its people as I could save. We bring him grave and urgent news. The village headman's eyes widened, and his gaze then quickly shifted to the youth standing beside them in the fancy clothes before quickly shifting away again, because staring at a prince was probably considered quite rude. It'll be done. Marcus then turned to a nearby bloke and nodded, who subsequently leapt on a horse and buggered off. Willem's our finest rider. He'll reach Capital City well out of you and deliver your message. We'll gather horses and what food we can to spare for your journey as well. Thanks again. Lothar then turned to his violet-robed friend. Gather those that would come with us, Kedgar, and make ready. We'll leave as soon as possible. A few short hours later, Lothar, Khadgar, Prince Varian Rin, and a bunch of other nameless peeps had left South Shore and set off on their journey to Lordaeron's kingdom. How far is it? 
I don't know, a week? We should see the city spires in about five days, give or take. Then we'll have to pass through Silver Pine Forest, skirt Lordermere Lake. The city lies on its north shore. Kadgar then fell silent, and Lothar studied his companion. He was worried about the guy. Things had got real ugly and nightmarish at Karazhan. Kadgar had been forced to administer a lethal blow to his master. That can't have been easy for the young man. Or is it old man now? Lothar still didn't really understand what had happened that night. Perhaps he never would. But somehow, during that battle, Kadgar had changed. And despite being younger than Lothar by almost four decades, he now appeared much older than him. And things hadn't exactly been sunshine and rainbows for Lothar, either. But Eve had been his friend. And also, King Lane. Lothar shook his head and tried to drive away the tears. His king, dead, and Stormwind was gone. But the former champion of Stormwind couldn't allow himself to succumb to his emotions at this moment, as people needed him. Hell, even the people of this land needed him. They just didn't know it yet. Meanwhile, Khadgar was also lost in his own thoughts, reliving the highlights of the entire Last Guardian series. And he was a little bit conflicted about how he should be feeling about the whole damned thing. Should he be sad that his master had died? Or enraged by what Medivh had done? Or even awed that one man could resist the influence of a titan for so long? He had no idea. His mind was a whirl, as was his heart. There was also the matter that Khadgar was back home, or at least back in his homeland. He hadn't expected to return here until he'd reached Master Mage status, and had always envisioned it as him landing atop the Violet Citadel on a griffin, whilst all his former teachers and fellows were like, Hey, Khadgar, hey! But instead, he was riding a plough horse, leading a ragtag band of men to speak to the king about saving the world. It was kind of funny, really, he thought. So, what's the plan when we reach the city? Speak to the king. Oh, Stormwind is lost. Varian is still a prince and I'm still a champion. I've only met King Terranus briefly and it was a while back, so he might not recognise me. But he'll definitely recognise Varian. Plus that messenger from South Shore at least makes sure they're aware of our arrival. So he will grant us an audience. And then we'll tell him what happened. And what must be done. And what must we do? Gather the rulers of this land. Force them to see the danger. No nation can stand alone. Not against the Horde. Stormwind tried and is gone because of it. The people must unite and fight. Well, let's just hope they listen. For all our sakes. They will. They must. I only want to live my own life. Good and sat bolt upright, awake but confused by his surroundings. Where am I? What has happened? You were asleep, Gul'dan. Asleep like death. For weeks now, you've not moved. We thought your spirit gone. Did you now? Were you afraid I would leave you, Chogul? Abandon you to Blackhand's tender mercies? Blackhand is dead, Gul'dan. Dead? At first, the warlock thought he'd misheard the ogre. But as both of Chogul's heads nodded and pulled the same grim expressions, he realised it was true. How? What has happened while I slept? Chogul began to answer, but two burly orc warriors then burst into the room, shoved the ogre out the way, and roughly grabbed Gul'dan's arms. Wait, where are you taking me? Gul'dan tried to wrestle his arms free, but it was no use. Even at full strength, he was no match for the warriors, and at this moment in time, he could barely hold himself upright. So he just sort of went all limp like a sack of spuds as the two orcs dragged him off. He took control, Gul'dan, while you were unconscious. He killed most of the Shadow Council. Only you and I and a few of the lesser warlocks remain. Gul'dan shook his head. He still felt fuzzy, unfocused, and this did not seem like the best time to lack clarity. Who? Who did this? But Chogol had slowed his steps and fallen back. And as Gul'dan turned to look ahead, he saw a powerful figure standing before him. A massive warrior holding a colossal warhammer. And finally, Gul'dan understood. So you're awake. I... Silence! I did not say you could speak. I know what you've done, Gul'dan. I know how you control Black Ant. You and your Shadow Council. Oh yes, Gul'dan. I know about them. But your warlocks can't help you now. They're dead. Many of them. And those that aren't are chained and watched. I rule the Horde now, Gul'dan. Not you. Not your warlocks. Me. Doomhammer alone. And there will be no more dishonor, no more treachery, no more deceit and lies. 
Orgrim then rose to his full impressive height, towering over Gul'dan. Juratan died from your scheming, but he will be the last, and he will be avenged. No more will you rule our people from the shadows. No more will you control our fate. Our people will be free of you. Orgrim raised his hammer, and Gul'dan cowered. He'd always known Doomhammer could become a problem. Too intelligent, too honourable, and too noble for his own good. It was time to think fast. Wait. Please. I beg you. You. The mighty Gul'dan. Beg. Very well, Doc. Beg. Beg for your life. God, Gul'dan hated this guy. Hated him with a passion. But this was the only option. I bow to your might, Orgrim Doomhammer. I acknowledge you as War Chief of the Horde, and I pledge myself to you. I will obey you in all things. You've never demonstrated obedience before. Why should I believe you capable of it now? Because you need me. You've slain my Shadow Council, yes? Consolidated your power over the Horde? As it should be. Blackhand was not strong enough to lead us on his own. But you are, so you have no need of a council. But you do need warlocks. The humans of magic of their own. Without us, you will fall to their power. You have only a few warlocks left, Orgrim. Myself, Shogul, a handful of neophytes. I'm simply too useful to kill for revenge. Doomhammer snarled, but then lowered his hammer. He hated this guy. Hated him with a passion. But he wasn't wrong. Oh, what you say is true. I will place the needs of the Horde over my own and allow you to live, Gul'dan. You and those are your warlocks that remain. But only as long as you prove useful. Oh, we will be useful, mighty Doomhammer. For I will create for you a host of creatures such as you have never seen before. Warriors who will serve you alone. With their might and our magic, we will crush this world's magi. The Horde will trample its enemies into the dust. Very well. I'll hold you to that. And that was that. Orgrim turned and buggered off. The Orc Warriors also buggered off. And Gul'dan was left in a crumpled heap on the floor. Damn him. And damn that human wizard prick as well. When Gul'dan entered Medivh's mind, seeking the information the Magus had promised but never given, how the bloody hell was he supposed to know the human was about to be killed? And that Gul'dan's own spirit would be weakened by the sudden violence, causing him to fall into some kind of coma or something. That was just some plain old bad luck bullshit. But that in turn had given Doomhammer the opportunity to seize control, and now everything had gone to shit. It was infuriating. Jogor then approached from behind, and helped the old warlock to his feet. Gather the others. The Storm Reavers will show all the Horde what we warlocks can accomplish. Not even Doomhammer will be able to deny their worth. Gather your clan as well, Jogor. There is much to be done. As the group neared Capital City, Lothar couldn't help but feel a little bit impressed. Lordaeron's kingdom wasn't as tall as Stormwind, but what it lacked in height, it made up for in elegance. It's a mighty place, though I prefer a little more warmth. Look, see those towers over there on the horizon? That's Dalaran, home of the Kirin Tor and its wizards. My home, before I was sent to Medivh. Maybe there'll be time for you to return, at least briefly. But for now, we should concentrate on the task at hand. Let's hope the people here are as noble in their thoughts as they are in their dwellings. A short ride later, and the party had reached the main gates to the city. Guards stood by the entrance, though the gate itself was wide open. One of the guards then stepped forward, and Lothar noticed the man walk right up to within sword range. Amateurs, he thought. However, he forced himself to relax. This was not Stormwind. These were not seasoned warriors. They never had to fight for their lives. At least not yet, anyway. Enter freely and be welcome. Marcus Radpath warned us of your arrival and your plight. You will find the king in his throne room. Thank you. Come, Lothar. Another way. The group continued, riding through the city streets. Kagar did indeed seem to know the way. Didn't have to stop to get his bearings or ask passers-by for directions once. They then parked up their horses and made their way up the palace's steps, walked through the courtyard and a bunch of corridors and stuff, until finally... They reached the throne room itself. It was an imposing chamber, round, with arches and columns everywhere, and there were several high balconies above, probably for nobles to observe proceedings, but Lothar did appreciate their strategic value. Put a few guards with bows up there and ain't nobody going to try any funny business. Wait, was that a little boy hanging about up there? 
What's all that about? Oh well, probably no one of any real significance or importance. At the centre of the room stood a man in glittery armour, tall and broad, a proper king, Lothar thought, just like Lane, one who would not hesitate to fight for his people. And for the first time in a while, Lothar felt hope. Yes? Who are you? And what do you wish of me? Your Majesty, I'm Anduin Lothar, a knight of Stormwind. This is my companion Khadgar of Dalaran, and this is Prince Varian Rin, heir to the throne of Stormwind. There were murmurs and gasps from the observing crowd, but Lothar ignored them and continued. We must speak with you, Your Majesty. It's a matter of great urgency. Of course, Your Majesty. We were grieved to hear of your father's death. King Lane was a good man. We counted him as a friend and an ally. Know that we shall do all in our power to restore you to your throne. Thank you. Now, tell me what has happened. I've always admired Stormwind's strength and beauty. What could destroy such a city? The Horde. The Horde did this. And what exactly is this Horde? It's an army. More than an army. It's a multitude. Enough to cover the land from shore to shore. And who commands this legion of men? Not men. Orcs. Lothar could see the puzzled look on Terranus' face, so he elaborated. A new race, not native to this world. As tall as we are, more powerfully built. Green skin and glowing red eyes. And tusks. <clears throat> you think I lie? Lothar turned to the crowd of nobles and began pointing at different dents within his own armour. This one was made by an orc war hammer. And this one by an orc war axe. These foul creatures destroyed my land, my home, my people. So if you doubt me, come over here and say it to my face. Enough. Enough. None here doubt your word, champion. Terranus then fired off a stern look around the room at the nobles, as if to say, any more smirks and I'll fucking murder you. I know of your honour and your loyalty. I will take you at your word. Thank you, King Terranus. I will summon my neighbouring kings. These events concern us all. Your Majesty, I offer you my home and my protection for as long as you shall need it. When you are ready, know that Lord Ron will assist you in reclaiming your kingdom. That's most generous of you, Your Majesty. I can think of no safer and finer place for the Prince to reach his maturity. Now, however, that we did not come here merely for sanctuary. We came here to warn you. For know this, the Horde will not stop at Stormwind. They mean to claim the entire world, and they have the might and the numbers to do it. Once they've finished with my homeland, they'll find a way across the ocean, and they will come here. You're telling us to prepare for war? Yes, a war for the very survival of our race. Orgrim Doomhammer, chieftain of the Blackrock clan, but also war chief of the Horde, stood and had a little look-see at the scene around him. Stormwind, or what was left of it anyway. It was mostly just burned buildings, bodies, and rubble now, and the war chief nodded to himself. This was good. It had been one hell of a battle, the humans, despite being outnumbered, had fought back with skill and determination. Doomhammer respected them for that. But they still bloody lost though, didn't they? Bunch of losers. The city had been breached, and now this land belonged to the Horde. This rich, fertile land. So like the Orcs' own homeworld had been. Before Gul'dan had ruined it. Bloody Gul'dan. What a prick. Thanks to that treacherous little shit, Orgrim had been forced to challenge his own chieftain, Blackhand. Forced to crush his former commander's skull. A man he'd sworn an oath to fight beside. But it had been time. Time to free the orcs from corruption. Time to restore some semblance of honour to the Horde. Orgrim's thoughts were then interrupted as he noticed two figures approaching. One shorter than the average orc, the other far taller, with two heads. Have you completed your task then? Not yet, noble Doomhammer. But I have at last shaken off the effects of my prolonged slumber. And I bring powerful news, drawn from that same long repose. Oh, your sleep's brought you wisdom, has it? It has shown me the path to great power. Power for you or for the Horde? For both. I have seen a place. Ancient, beyond imagining. Older even than the sacred mountain of our home world. It lies deep beneath the ocean. And within it rests a power that could reshape this world. We could claim it as our own. And none can stand against us. None can stand against us now. And I prefer the honest might of hammer and axe to whatever foul sorceries you've uncovered. Look what your scheming did the last time. I will not have you destroy our people further or wreck this new world just as we've begun to conquer it. This is far greater than your desires. My destiny lies beneath the waves, and there is little you can do to stop that. Have a care, 
Warlock, remember what happened to your precious Shadow Council. I could crush your skull in an instant. And then where will your destiny lie? Orgrim then glanced up at the towering Chogul. Ogres. Ugh. Twats. Do not think this abomination will save you either. I've failed Ogres before. Even the Gron. I can and will do so again. Your goals are no longer important, Gul'dan. Only the Horde matters. For a second, Orgrim saw anger flicker within Gul'dan's eyes. Was the little prick not going to back down? One could only hope. Go on, try something, Orgrim thought. Give me no choice but to be rid of you. But the anger then vanished, to be replaced by coercion and grudging respect. Of course, mighty Doomhammer. You are correct. The Horde must come first. And I have many new ideas to aid our conquest. But first, I shall deliver the warriors I promised. Unstoppable but fully under your control. Good. I will not ignore anything that can make our success more assured. Orgrim then turned away, dismissing the warlock and his lieutenant. And both Gul'dan and Cho'Gul took the hint and buggered off. And once they were gone, Orgrim decided to sort out one of his own lieutenants. And he pretty quickly found him, just sort of hanging about. Zulahed. Doomhammer. How goes the work? The same. A few months back, Zuluhead had approached Doomhammer and informed him of strange visions he was having. Visions of a particular mountain range, and a mighty treasure buried beneath it. And Doomhammer had always respected the older chieftain, so he granted him permission to lead his clan in search of that mountain. And after a few weeks, the Dragonmoor clan had indeed found something special. A golden disc that they'd named the Demon Soul. Doomhammer hadn't seen the artifact himself, but Zulahed assured him that it was totes the real deal. Unfortunately, they were still having a bit of difficulty figuring out how the bloody thing worked. You assured me you could trigger its power. And I shall. I'll find the key. I know it. Once we tap its power, we'll use it to enslave our chosen servants. And with those beneath us, we shall rule the skies and rain fire down on all those who stand against us. Excellent. Keep me posted, you goddamn maniac. Meanwhile, Gul'dan watched the Warchief from a few buildings away, being a sneaky bugger as per usual. What is he planning? I don't know. I've been secretive about it. I know it involves something the Dragonmoor found in the mountains. Half their clan is there now, but I don't know what they're doing. Well, whatever it is, it matters not. It'll keep Doomhammer distracted, and that works to our advantage. Keeps him from discovering our plans before we set them in motion. Are you going to replace him as war chief? Me? No. I have no desire to march through the streets with an axe or a hammer. My path is a far greater one. I shall meet my foes in spirit and crush them from afar. Devour them by the hundreds and thousands. Soon all that was promised to me shall be mine. Doomhammer will be nothing against me. Even the might of the Horde will pale in comparison. Khadgar watched quietly from the edge of the throne room. Lothar had asked him to be here, as a witness and stuff, and Khadgar's own curiosity had compelled him to accept the invitation. But he knew he wasn't a part of this conversation, he was not an equal to these men. Plus, he kind of felt like he'd been in the centre of things too much lately. It was nice to slip into the background for a change. Khadgar recognised many of the men present. There was Gen Greymane, King of Gilneas, far more clever than his appearance suggested. Then there was Grand Admiral Dalin Proudmoor, ruler of Kul Tiris, but also commander of the world's largest, fiercest navy. The quiet, cultured-looking man was Lord Aidan Perinold, master of Alterac, and he seemed to be glaring at Thoris Trollbane, who was king of the neighbouring Stromgard. But Trollbane was paying him no mind, because he was too busy focused on a short, stout man who needed no introduction anywhere on the entire continent. Alonzus Fowl, Archbishop of the Church of Light, revered by humans everywhere, and Khadgar could see why. The guy radiated a sense of peace and wisdom. A violet flicker then caught the corner of Khadgar's eye, so he turned and had to stop himself from gushing like a fangirl by the bloke who passed him. Archmage Antonidas, the legend. In all his years at Dalaran, Khadgar had only ever seen the leader of the Kirin Tor twice. But to see him now, standing beside these monarchs and looking just as regal as the rest of them, it filled Khadgar with awe, as well as a surprising wave of homesickness. He missed Dalaran, he realised. Maybe after the wars were over, assuming they survived, he'd finally get to go home. But Antonidas was the last to arrive, and so the Royal Brain Trust got started. Thank you all for coming. I know the request seems sudden, but we have matters of grave import to discuss. 
and time seems to be of the essence. I present to you Anduin Lothar, champion of Stormwind. He's come here as a messenger, and more, perhaps even a saviour. I think it best for me to let him tell you what he's seen, and what we may expect to see soon ourselves. Lothar then stepped forward. Terranus had offered him fresh clothing, but the champion of Stormwind had insisted on keeping his own tattered armour, possibly for added effect. Your Majesties, I'm no poet or diplomat, but a warrior, so I'll keep my words brief and blunt. My home, Stormwind, is no more. Once again, gasps and murmurs, but Lothar continued. It fell before a horde of creatures known as orcs. They're terrible foes, as tall as a man but far stronger. Bestial features, green skin and red eyes. This time, no one laughed. They were off to a good start. This horde appeared recently and began harassing our patrols. But those were just raiding parties. When their full force marched, we were astounded. Thousands. Tens of thousands. Enough to cover the land in a foul shadow. They're strong and cruel and merciless. We fought them as best we could, but it wasn't enough. They besieged our city, wreaked havoc across the land itself. King Lane died at their hands. Kagar noted that Lothar didn't mention how the king had died. Perhaps mentioning the half-orc assassin they'd all trusted as an ally was probably not the best idea in this moment. Plus, neither Lothar or Khadgar really wanted to think about that. Even with witnessing that vision with Garona back at Medivh's tower, Khadgar still didn't exactly feel great about her betrayal. They killed most of our nobles as well. I brought the prince, and as many people as I could to safety, and I brought this warning. The Horde is not from this world. They will not be content to control a single continent. They'll want the rest of them as well. You're saying they're coming here, lad? Yes. Lothar's simple response sent a ripple of surprise, and perhaps fear, through the room. But Proudmoor had more questions. Do they have ships? I'm not sure. We didn't see any before, but we hadn't even seen the Horde itself until this past year. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So they could be sailing towards us as we speak. They could march over land as well. Don't forget that. True. We first encountered them out east, at the Swamp of Sorrows. They made it to Stormwind from there by foot. If they turned north, they could cross the burning steppes and the mountains, come upon Lordaeron from the south. The south, they shall not pass us. I'll crush any who attempt landfall on my coast. You don't understand. You haven't faced them. I know their numbers and strength are difficult to comprehend, but you cannot stand against them. Not alone. Stormwind's armies were great. My warriors were trained and seasoned, but before the Horde itself we fell like adult children. They'll sweep across the mountains, across your lands, and across you. What do you propose we do then? Archbishop Fowl spoke at just the right time, really. Tempers were starting to flare a little bit. Kings don't like being called fools and stuff, especially not in front of other kings. We need to band together, unite, fight them as one. You say this threat is coming, I won't dispute it. And you say we must all band together to end the threat. But I wonder, have you actually tried any other method to resolve the matter? Surely these orcs can be rational. Surely they have some goal in mind. Perhaps we could parley. Lothar shook his head and made no effort to hide how stupid he thought that idea was. They want this world. Our world. They'll not settle for less. We did send messengers. Envoys. Ambassadors. Most of them came back in pieces if they came back at all. Kagar could see the way the kings were standing, murmuring. Seemed like they still didn't really understand the danger they all faced. So he sighed and took a step forward. However, before he could speak, another robed wizard piped up instead. Hear me. I have received reports before now of this new menace. The wizards in and around Stormwind were at first intrigued and then terrified by the orc's presence. And they sent many letters requesting aid. I fear we did not listen as well as we might have. We appreciated their danger, but thought the orcs little more than a local nuisance, confined to that one kingdom. Seems now we were wrong. They are dangerous. Many I respect have confirmed this. We disregard the champion's voice at our own peril. If they're so dangerous, why did the wizards of Stormwind not just deal with them? Use their magic to end the threat. Because the orcs have magic of their own. Potent magic. Most of their warlocks are weaker than our wizards, at least from what my fellows have reported. Yet they have far greater numbers and can work in unison, something my own brethren have always struggled with. 
Gagar swore he heard a hint of bitterness in the Archmage's voice, and he couldn't agree more. If there was one thing every member of the Kirin Tor valued, it was their own independence. Getting even two wizards to work together was hard enough. More than that was beyond imagining. Our wizards did fight back, turned the tide of several battles, but the Archmage is correct. We lacked the numbers, magically and physically. Every orc spellcaster killed, another rose to take its place with two more beside it. Lothar then frowned for the millionth time recently. Our greatest wizard, Medivh, fell to the Horde's darkness. Most of our wizards were lost as well. I don't think magic alone will turn them back. Once again, Gadgar noted that Lothar did not mention how or why Medivh had died. Probably wouldn't have helped their case much. Antonidas did direct a sharp glance towards Khadgar at the mention of the Guardian though. Sooner or later, the Council of the Kirin Tor would demand a full explanation. They would not be satisfied with anything less than the truth. So Khadgar wasn't exactly looking forward to that conversation. I find it strange that a stranger to our shores would be so concerned with our survival. Forgive me for treading on such fresh wounds, sir, but um, your own kingdom is gone. Your king dead. Your prince is little more than a boy. Your land's overrun. You brought word of this threat to us, for which we are grateful, but you speak repeatedly of what we must do. Not entirely sure you're the best person to provide advice, really. And you say we should unite. But if we were to consider your suggestion, what could you possibly add to the assembly? I will not have my guest insulted, so Aiden. This man has brought us this news at his own personal peril. He's shown nothing but honour and compassion, despite what I imagine is immense personal grief. Perinold nodded and half bowed in a sort of silent, slightly mocking apology. Further, you are wrong to label him alone or invaluable. Prince Varian Rin is now my honoured guest, and will be so until he chooses to depart. I've pledged myself to aiding him in regaining his kingdom. More murmurs from the kings and stuff, and Khadgar knew what they were thinking. Terranus had just renounced any claims he might have made to Stormwind, and warned the other kings that Varian had his full support. All in one statement. Clever move. Clever man. Sir Lothar has brought others with him from their kingdom, including some soldiers. Their numbers might not be significant, but their experience in dealing with the orcs first hand is invaluable. And finally, you are wrong to label him a stranger. Though he has never graced this continent with his presence, Lothar has strong ties to this land. He is of the Arathi bloodline, the last of their noble line. He has just as much right to speak at this council as any of us. That revelation caused quite the stir among the other kings. Even Khadgar looked at his companion with new eyes. An Arathi, the first nation on the continent, the people who had formed strong ties with the elves and fought an epic battle against trolls and ended their threat forever. Bloody hell. It's true. I descend from King Thoradin, the founder of Arathor. My family went south after the Empire's collapse and founded a new nation there which became known as Stormwind. So you've come to claim sovereignty over us? No. My ancestors surrendered any claim to Lord Ron long ago when they chose to depart. But I still have ties to this land, which my people helped conquer and civilize. And he can still call upon ancient pacts for aid. The elves swore to support Thoradin and his line in times of need. They will still honor that commitment. That drew appreciative whispers from the gathering. Suddenly, Lothar was more than just a soldier in their eyes. He was a potential ambassador. With the ancient magic-wielding elves on their side, the lingering threat of this horde didn't seem so bad. This is a great deal to take in. Perhaps we should give ourselves time to consider all we've heard. Agreed. Food has been set out in the dining hall. I invite you all to join me. Not as kings, but as neighbours and friends. Let us not discuss this matter over our food, but rather mull it to ourselves. Then we may be able to approach it more clearly, after digesting the food and the danger that lies before us. Gagar observed as the monarchs nodded and started to bugger off. Perinold was a wily one, that was certain. The type of guy who probably waits to see which way a crowd is walking and then runs to the front and yells, follow me. Doomhammer was currently having a little chat with one of his lieutenants, Rend Blackhand of the Blacktooth Grin clan, which you would imagine would be a little bit awkward considering who Rend's father was, but no, not really. However, their little chat was interrupted by a scout who came running up, looking like he had some pretty important news to deliver. Trolls! Forest trolls! A full war party by the looks of it! Trolls? What? Are they attacking us? I thought they were smarter than Ogus. 
not dumber. Doomhammer noted Ren's observation. The one time the War Chief had encountered forest trolls, he'd been impressed and even slightly concerned by how cunning they were. Seemed a bit moronic and out of character for them to try and attack the Horde. Not attacking. They've been captured. By humans. Where? Not far from here. How many? About 40 humans. 10 trolls, including their leader. Doomhammer nodded and turned to Rend. Gather your strongest warriors. And quickly, you leave at once. But be clear, Rend. This is a raiding party only. You are to rescue the trolls and bring them back here with you. Avoid being seen as much as possible and kill any who spot you. I will not have our battle plans ruined because you were careless. The Blacktooth Grin Chieftain nodded and departed without a word, and now it was just a matter of playing the waiting game. But in the meantime, Orgrim's thoughts turned to the past. Blackhand had shocked the Orcs back on their homeworld, declaring his intent to ally with the Ogres. Not everyone had been happy about it, Orgrim included, but it had proven a useful partnership. Those monstrous creatures had lent considerable strength to the Horde. So, upon entering the Dark Portal and arriving on Azeroth, Blackhand had again called for his followers to go forth and find more allies on this new strange world. Maybe there were ogres here as well or something. And after about two weeks of encountering nothing but humans and a few of the diminutive but mighty dwarfs, Orgrim met some new peeps that fit the bill. Forest trolls. In a forest, obviously. We are not your foes. It should be wanting, Morsel. Your leader. I would speak with him on behalf of my own. The creature laughed at that. We no be speaking with morsels. We be eating them. The troll then thrust its spear in a hard swift motion that would have gutted Doomhammer had he remained still for the blow. However, Orgrim twisted, pulled his hammer and bellowed a war cry. And the troll paused and looked absolutely terrified. And in its hesitation, Doomhammer leapt forward and smashed the creature's leg full in the knee and then turned to the rest of the ambushing trolls. I say again, your leader. That gesture worked. The rest of the trolls dropped their weapons immediately and now looked extremely willing to comply to any request the orcs might have. If you wanted to speak with Zul'jin, I'd be bringing him here. We shall wait. So, that particular troll buggered off and the remaining trolls and the orcs started to wait. But Orgrim got bored after a few minutes so he decided to make conversation and defuse some of the tension. What are you called? I am Krultan, Orgrim Doomhammer of the Blackrock Clan. What are your people? We are forest trolls. A Marni tribe. Doomhammer nodded. Forest trolls. And they had tribes. So they were civilized then. They'd make good allies. Native to this world, so they knew its geography, its inhabitants, and its dangers. After about an hour, the troll that had left returned, as well as a few others. You'd be wanting Zol'jin. Here I am. Doomhammer looked the troll up and down and sort of assessed the guy. Nice scarf. I am Doomhammer. And yes, I would speak with you. My leader. Blackhand leads the Orc Horde. No doubt you've seen our people moving through the forest. We be seeing you. You be clumsier than the humans. What you be wanting with us? You want our forest, you be fighting us for them. And you be losing. Doomhammer had no doubt that Zul'jin was correct in that statement. The Horde massively outnumbered them, but if all forest trolls were as sneaky as these buggers, the Orcs would indeed have problems. We don't want your forests. We want your strength. We plan to conquer this world. And we would have you beside us as allies. Allies? Why? What would we gain? Well, what would you want? One of the trolls started to say something in a strange hissing language, but Zul'jin cut him off. We need nothing from you. We have our forests. None dare intrude here, save for the accursed elves. And we'd be handling them ourselves. These elves? They're racing to themselves? A mighty one? Mighty? Yeah. But we'd be killing them since ancient times. We need no help with them. Why pick them off one by one, though? Why not march into their homes? Destroy them. With the Horde behind you, you could crush the elves once and for all. Hold the forest without contest. Zul'jin appeared to consider that, and for a moment, Orgrim dared to hope that he'd agree. But the troll then shook his head. Nah. We fight the elves ourselves. We need no help. And we're not wanting the rest of the world. Not anymore. Fighting others will not be giving us anything. Ugh. I understand. My leader will be disappointed, as am I, but I respect your decision. Still to this day, Doomhammer regretted the troll leader's decision. However, as Rend Blackhand approached, with a whole bunch of rescued trolls accompanying him, perhaps they now had an opportunity to try again. The humans were careless, assuming the only threat in the forest was the one they'd already captured. No one who Thoroth lived. Good. Orgrim then turned to Zul'jin 
And based on the troll's expression, Doomhammer could see that he remembered their encounter just as well as Orgrim did. When I heard you'd been captured, I sent my warriors at once. Your leader be sending you? I am leader now. Your horde still be seeking to conquer the world, yeah? Doomhammer nodded. This was it. The moment of truth. We be aiding you then, as you aided us. Allies. Allies. Meanwhile, in chapter 5 of the book, two days after the Royal Brain Trust, Lothar found himself back in the throne room again for yet another Royal Brain Trust. Khadgar was again in attendance, and Lothar was glad of the lad's presence. He was the only one Lothar knew, really. Terranus was a kind enough host, but Khadgar reminded Lothar of home, even if he wasn't actually from Stormwind himself. It was difficult still to accept that home was gone. Lothar kept expecting to turn and see Lane standing right there, asking him what the bloody hell he was doing in Lordaeron. But Lane was dead. Stormwind was dead. And its champion had vowed to keep this land from following the same fate or die trying. To be honest though, it felt more like this mission was going to cost him his sanity rather than his life. Politics. What a load of old shit. He had no patience for it. It was all a game, Lane had once told him. A game of positioning and influence and manoeuvring. No one ever really won. You just kind of waved your dick around a little bit until someone with a bigger dick waved theirs. After lunch that first day, all the monarchs seemed to accept that the Horde were coming, even Perinold. But it had taken the rest of the day to convince them that unifying was the answer. Terranus, Trollbane and Proudmoor took little coaxing, but Perinold and Greymane had been a little bit more difficult. The ruler of Ultarak was pretty obviously afraid of battle, and that attitude probably extended to his subjects, Lothar thought, meaning his men would probably not be that useful anyway. Lothar was surprised by Greymane's reluctance though. That guy certainly looked like a warrior, but he'd been quick to suggest other options every time the subject turned to war, and it was only after Trollbane and Proudmoor outright accused the man of cowardice that he started to come round to the idea. On the second day, more of the same really. They'd settled on the idea of war at least, but now they had to discuss the logistics of cooperation and stuff. Which army would supply what troops? Where would they be stationed? Who was going to pay for all this? And the biggest question of all, who was going to command them? Obviously each king felt that they should be the one in charge. Terranus stated that Lordaeron was the largest of the kingdoms. Trollbane claimed to have the most actual fighting experience. Proudmoor mentioned the power of his navy. Greymane felt, due to his lands likely being the first overrun, he should be commander. And Perinold suggested brute force alone wasn't enough. The commander should be intelligent and wise, which he obviously considered himself to be. And then there were the two non-kings. Archbishop Fowl and Archmage Antonidas. Still very much rulers in their own right. Fortunately though, they weren't interested in leadership at all. They actually acted more like moderators, keeping the kings focused and stuff, so that was helpful. And now it was the third day. Lothar had no idea what, if any, progress would be made, but he did know that he was starting to get really bloody bored of all of this talking. We're all here then. Good. Now, we've all agreed the time is of the essence and we've all agreed upon our course of action. The rest of the monarchs nodded, and Lothar wondered when the bloody hell they'd all agreed on their course of action. Was he missing something? Then I hereby declare the founding of the Alliance of Lordaeron. We shall stand together as one, as our ancestors did long ago in the Arathi Empire, and it is only fitting that our commander should hail from that ancient ruling stock. We, the kings of the Alliance, do hereby appoint Lord Anduin Lothar as our supreme commander. You what, mate? Lothar stared at Terranus, who flashed him a wink, and then whispered some stuff so only Lothar could hear him. It was the only way, really. Each of them wanted to be in charge and were dead set against any of the others taking their place. You aren't a king, so none of them feel like anyone got any special treatment. But you're also of a noble bloodline, so they don't feel slighted by being passed over. Probably was a bit awkward for the other kings to just stand there whilst Terranus whispered shit to Lothar, but whatevs. I know it's a great deal to ask of you. We would not if it went for our own very survival. Will you accept this charge? Didn't take long for Lothar to answer, since he didn't really have a choice anyway. I accept. I will lead the Alliance army against the Horde. Very good. Let us now each go to assemble our own troops, gear and supplies. I suggest we all meet again in one week to present our rosters and inventories to Lord Lothar, so that he may see what forces he has at his disposal and begin his planning. The rest of the kings nodded, and each approached the champion in turn to congratulate him on his appointment. The sentiments from Perinold and Greymane seemed a little less sincere though. And then they all buggered off, leaving Lothar, Khadgar and the two non-kings in the throne room by themselves. Out of the frying pan, eh? And you let them talk you into that. Those clever bastards. They'd sell their own children if they knew it would win them more land. 
I particularly like the way they just assumed you'd accept. But I guess that's what happens when you have authority over others. You forget that anyone else matters, much less has a say in anything. <clears throat> Kadgar then looked at the other two men present and went bright red in his face cheeks. Not all authority is corrupt and self-serving, young man. There are those of us called to serve by leading, just as your friend here was. Of course, father. Forgive me. I, I didn't mean to imply... I wasn't talking about you, I just... <clears throat> Enough, lad. I don't blame you for your outburst. Lord Lothar was indeed neatly manoeuvred into that trap. I must confess, however, I too lent my weight to that decision. You are a good man, sir. I believe you are our best choice. Thank you, father. Lothar had never really been a religious man, but he had a great deal of respect for the Church of Light, and everything he'd seen of the Archbishop thus far had impressed him. Now, on to other matters. First, what can you tell me of Northshire, the Abbey? Did it survive? I'm afraid not, father. They tore it to pieces. A few of the clerics survived and are down in South Shore with the others, but the rest... I see. I will pray for them. The Archbishop then fell silent. Obviously, he'd meant he'd pray for them right now, so Cadgar and Lothar waited patiently and respectfully. Until finally, you will need lieutenants for your army, sir. I think it best if some of those come not from the kingdoms, but from the church. I have several in mind, and a new order, that I feel may prove extremely valuable to the Alliance. I'll need some time to iron out the details. Shall we say, four days? In the courtyard? Afternoon? You will not be disappointed, sir. The Archbishop then gave a little bow, and then walked away. And that just left the other non-king, the Archmage, who'd been watching them without a word this entire time. The might and wisdom of the Kirin are at your disposal, sir. I know you are acquainted with the Wizards of Stormwind, so you have some sense of our capabilities. I shall appoint one of our number to assist you and serve as our liaison. I would ask for Kadgar to fill that role, sir. He's already a trusted companion and has faced the orcs with me more than once. Of course. The Archmage then reached out and cupped Kadgar's chin with one hand, raising his head to study his face, and Kadgar had never felt so uncomfortable. You have suffered much. Your experience has marked you far more than in your appearance. I, uh, I did what had to be done, as we all must. You shall keep us surprised of the situation in the field, young Kadgar, and communicate Lord Lothar's needs and requests as quickly as possible. You shall also coordinate the efforts of any other Magi present. I trust this is within your capabilities. Kadgar nodded. Good. I shall expect you at Dalaran at your earliest convenience, so that we may discuss other important matters. The gem embedded at the top of the Archmage's staff then fled, and boof, he bloody disappeared. He wants to know about Medivh. Yep. What should I tell him? The truth. They need to know what happened. Ugh, yeah, all right. Well, that can wait until after lunch. I swear the Horde itself could not keep me from food right now. <laughs> yeah, you jest. Let's just hope we don't actually come to that. Four days later, Lothar and Cadgar went to the main courtyard and waited for Archbishop Fowl to arrive. And soon enough, he did. Thank you for indulging me. I wouldn't take up your time, but I really do believe this will help. But first, I would tell you, Sir Lothar, the church has pledged itself to Stormwind's aid. We shall gather funds to help you rebuild once the immediate crisis has passed. Thank you, Father. That means a great deal to me. And will to Prince Varian as well. The Holy Light will fill your home once more. The Archbishop then paused for a moment. When you spoke of Northshire Abbey's destruction, I was dismayed. I wondered how the rest of my clergy could possibly survive the coming war. Clearly these orcs are a threat even to sturdy warriors like yourself. So how could a mere priest defend themself? And as I felt these concerns, an idea appeared to me. As if brought by the Holy Light itself. What if there was a way to ensure that warriors fought for the Light? And with the Light? Using both its gifts and their own martial prowess? Is there a way? I believe so, yes. I will establish a new branch of the Church. Paladins. I've already selected a few candidates. Some knights, others priests. They will be trained, not only in war, but in prayer and in healing. They'll have the ability to bless themselves and others in the Holy Light. The Archbishop then turned and beckoned, and four random blokes emerged from a nearby passage. May I present Uther, Sade and Dathrahan, Tyrion Fordring, and Duralion. These will be the Knights of the Silver Hand. I shall leave you six to discuss matters. Thou was absolutely beaming like a proud father, but he then buggered off, just as he said he would. Some of these paladin blokes, like the young Turalyon, looked a little bit overwhelmed, but Uther and Tyrion seemed more composed, 
and Uther went ahead and took the lead. My lord, the Archbishop told us of the upcoming battle and of the Horde's approach. We're at your service and at the service of the people. Use us as you see fit, sword or shield. You were a knight before. Aye, my lord, but I've been a devout follower of the church since my youth. I met Fowl back when he was merely a bishop. I was honoured when he told me of this new order and offered me a place within it. Uther's jaw then tightened. With the coming of these foul creatures, I know we will need the Light's blessing to protect our lands and our people. Lothar nodded. He could understand why the man had turned to faith, and he had no doubt that Uther would be a powerful force on the battlefield. But still, there was something about the guy's zeal that unnerved him a little bit. He suspected the guy was a bit of a boy scout, focused on honour and faith and stuff. Probably wasn't likely to use less noble methods to ensure success. And that could be a bit of a problem. Lothar had learned from bitter experience. To survive against the Horde, they were going to need to use any means necessary. Lothar, Khadgar and the four paladins spent the next hour chatting, until finally the paladins buggered off and Lothar turned to his wizard companion. Well, what do you think of them? I doubt they'll be much use to us. And why's that? They're not prepared. The Horde's going to arrive in Lordaeron in what? Weeks? And none of these men have seen battle, at least not as paladins. I'm sure they can fight, but if the Archbishop's expecting them to perform miracles, I'm pretty sure he's going to be disappointed. Yeah, I agree. The Vow has faith in them, so perhaps we must as well. But assuming they are ready, somehow, what's your opinion of them? Uther will be dangerous for the Horde, that's for certain. I don't think he could command men other than paladins, though. His beliefs are a bit, you know, in your face. Most soldiers wouldn't be able to endure that for too long. Saden and Tyrion as well. They were knights and warriors once, but they've since found faith. That may make them hesitate to use less noble tactics. And Trellion? The least of them in faith, and thus the highest in my eyes. Didn't seem to have the same blinding zeal as the others. Lothar was impressed by Khadgar's keen eye for these things. Little Bastard had basically drawn all the same conclusions as him, all on his own. Trellion did indeed seem like the most promising of the candidates. Although he'd seemed reluctant to speak at first, he eventually came out of his shell and appeared to have quite the bright, agile mind with more appreciation for subtleties and shades than his fellows. I agree. I'll speak with Fowl. The Paladins will no doubt be valued assets. I'll take Uther as our liaison to them and any other forces the church can supply. And I think I'll propose an additional candidate as well. Gavin Rad. He was one of my knights, and a good man. He'll make a fine Paladin. But I'll take Turalyon to serve as one of my lieutenants. Good choice. Now let's just hope the Horde gives us enough time to prepare them and everything else. We'll prepare what we can, and we'll face them when we must. Not much else we can do anyway. Gul'dan was bloody furious, because things were not going according to plan. Why have you not succeeded yet? We're trying, Gul'dan. We've been able to animate the bodies, but not give them consciousness. At the moment, they're little more than shells. We can direct them as puppets, but their movements are sloppy and slow. They don't really pose a threat to anyone. Rakmar Sharpfang the oldest of the surviving orc necromancers, if you don't count Gul'dan himself, was the Necrolite's unofficial leader, and as a result, he often found himself being the one who had to report the bad news to the High Warlock, so it kind of sucked to be him. But Gul'dan just stood there, glaring at the bodies strewn on the ground. Lifeless. Useless. They'd been humans once, warriors, slain here in the battle for Stormwind, but they could potentially be a powerful addition to the Horde. The new forces that the old Warlock had promised Doomhammer, but only if these worthless assistants pulled their fingers out their asses and stopped faffing about. Find a way. Gul'dan was half tempted to strike some necrolites down right where they stood, but he stopped himself. They'd be even more useless if they were dead. However, a thought then popped into his head. Brilliant. Of course, that was the answer. You're right, Rachma. You're trying your best. I understand. This is a new and different thing we are attempting. It would pose a great challenge to anyone. I have no right to be angry that you have not yet succeeded. Please, return to your work. I will leave you in peace to experiment once more. Uh, thank you. Udan could see that Rachmar was a little bit taken aback by the sudden empathy, as were the other warlocks, and he suppressed a chuckle, simply nodding to them and then buggering off. Let them think he gave a shit. Let them think whatever they like. Wouldn't matter soon anyway. Gudan then turned a corner and found Chogul, ever waiting, as always. Two-headed Knob was never that far away. The Necrolites have served their purpose. Now they have a new one. A far greater one. 
gather our implements. We shall be making a sacrifice. Sometime later, after Gul'dan and Cho'Gul had done a little bit of construction and sent out a call for the Necrolites to join them, are we summoning our fallen brethren? Rakmar spoke softly, but Gul'dan could see he and the other Necrolites were desperately trying to figure out what this new altar was all about. Yes, Doomhammer slaughtered the other warlocks, but their souls yet linger. We will summon them and instill them within the human bodies. They will be eager to return to this world and serve the Horde once more. Right, that'll definitely animate them. But will it give them power? Or will they be little more than walking corpses? Silence! We begin. And begin they did. Gul'dan summoned his magic and felt it fill him with power. Not enough power, mind you, but that would soon change. But in the meantime, he continued channeling his energies into the altar, priming it for the transformation he was about to evoke. And the rest of the Necrolites joined in, lending their own magic to the incantation. <laughs> Gul'dan couldn't stop the weird arousal growl from popping out. He was just too damned excited. He just his pants, guys. It's in the book. We all know I just read them verbatim and I'm going to get sued. With the Necrolites good and distracted, it was finally time. So he moved behind Rakmar, unsheathed his dagger, and slit the poor sod's throat. And as Rakmar gasped and choked and fell and thrashed and stuff, Gul'dan stabbed him right in the chest and removed the still beating heart. And then cast a spell, binding Rakmar's spirit within it. <sighs> Do not fear, Rakmar, for this is not the end of you. On the contrary, you shall now actually succeed at your task. Gul'dan then let out a goofy chuckle. That's the good thing about necromancers. We never let anything go to waste. The old warlock then glanced up and observed his surroundings. Jogul had already killed many of the other Necrolites, and the remaining ones were kind of just shitting themselves in a corner. Too scared to either flee or fight. Typical. Even in their final moments, they were bloody worthless. Well, have you succeeded? I have, noble Doomhammer. Gudan then gestured at the bodies behind him, which Orgrim looked at and raised an eyebrow. Fallen Stormwind soldiers. Big whoops. Did you ask me here to show me you could line up bodies neatly? Is this the extent of your power, Gul'dan? To prepare corpses for burial? Ooh, how Gul'dan longed to wipe the smirk off this asshole's face. But now is not the time. Of course not. Watch. Gul'dan then nodded to Chogul, who knelt down near the first body and placed a jeweled baton type thing in the corpse's hand. It had been quite time consuming creating those enchanted weapons, but without said weapons, this new force would be far less powerful. The corpse itself then stirred slightly before rising to its feet, its movement stiff at first but becoming more fluid by the second, and it then opened its eyes, revealing them to be a glowing red. You have succeeded then, Gul'dan. You have returned my spirit to this world. Excellent. Welcome back, Terran Gorfiend. Yes, I have brought you back, to further serve the Horde. The War Chief then stepped forward and studied the creature. Gorfiend? One of your warlocks from the Shadow Council. I killed him myself. We all give ourselves to the Horde. Gorfiend's soul had not departed this plane. I merely recalled it and found it a new home. Only now his very body is imbued with sorcery. He's more powerful than ever. This then is what you give me. Walking corpses, powered by your dead acolytes. Orgrim's face then twisted in disgust. You asked for warriors? I provided them. They will be a match for anything the humans have and more. And although their bodies may be rotted human flesh, they are still orcs in spirit and in allegiance. And they can still wield their magic as well. Just think what they'll accomplish in battle. Doomhammer nodded and considered those things. Will you serve me? <laughs> War chiefs don't ask. They command, Gul'dan thought. You're weak as shit, Doomhammer. The Gorfiend considered the War Chief's question for a moment, until finally, he nodded. As Gul'dan said, I'm still an orc despite this shell. I live for the Horde. I will serve you. You killed me, but I do not hold that against you, for it has resulted in this new powerful form. I'm well pleased with the trade. Good. Good. You shall be my Death Knights. The forefront of our great Horde. Together we'll crush the humans, take their lands, and make this world safe for our people. You've done as you promised, Gul'dan. Thank you. Of course, noble war chief. Anything for our people. Idiot, Gul'dan thought, as Doomhammer buggered off with his newly awakened best friends. 
Take them and go. Return to your war. Now that you're satisfied, I'll have the freedom to concentrate on my other plans. Gul'dan would play the loyal warlock a little while longer, he vowed, but not forever. Soon enough, he'd have what he needed, and then everyone else could go suck a bag of dicks and die or something. An entire week later, the war chief stood tall in front of a fortress Zul'jin had told him about, Blackrock Spire. It was a massive structure that stood atop Blackrock Mountain. Doomhammer was a little bit confused as to why this place shared the same name as his clan, despite them being from separate worlds, but what ifs? Massive bloody coincidence, mate. No reason for it. Don't ask questions. Below stood the orcs of every clan, waiting eagerly to hear what their war chief had to say. He'd already led them to victory once. Achieved more than Black Hand ever did, really. My people, hear me. We've taken this land and it is good. Rich with life. And we can raise strong families here. Yet it is not without its defenders. The humans are skilled and fight hard to retain what was theirs. The crowd murmured in agreement. There was no weakness in acknowledging a powerful foe, and the humans were certainly that. We must continue our conquest. Another land, Lordaeron, lies to the north, and once we control it, our clans may claim territories, settle, craft homes. But first, we must take it from the humans, and they will not surrender it lightly. Now the crowd was growling, showing their willingness to fight on. I know that you're strong. I know that you're warriors and will not falter in battle, but the humans are many, and this time they will be ready for us, but they will not be ready for our new allies. Doomhammer then motioned behind him, and Zul'jin stepped forward. The forest trolls are now part of the horde and will fight alongside us. They are as mighty as an ogre, but as crafty as an orc, and they're pretty good carpenters as well. They will be our guides, our scouts, our forest warriors. Together we'd be fighting the humans, the elves, and anyone else who stands against us. The crowd cheered, but Doomhammer wasn't finished. They are not our only new allies. The war chief again motioned behind him, and this time Terran Gorfine stepped forward. Although he wore a mask to conceal his hideous features, it was still pretty obvious to the orcs that there was something a bit off about him. So the crowd returned to murmuring again. We are the Death Knights. We have pledged ourselves to the Horde and to Doomhammer. We will fight as one of you. Drive your enemies from this world. Terran had requested that Doomhammer not reveal the Death Knight's true nature to the Orcs, as in who they'd been before, and Doomhammer had agreed. Probably was for the best to keep that a secret for now. The Death Knights will be our cavalry and our vanguard. They're strong and swift, and possess a dark magic that will strip away our foe's defenses. And finally, we may have another new ally. Soon. Orgrim glanced towards Zuluhead who just kind of shrugged. Guess they still needed more time, but the Trolls and the Death Knights were enough for now. We marched north, across the land and into Kazmadan. The Dwarves' lands are rich with metals and fuel. We'll take what's theirs, and we'll build a mighty fleet of ships. And with those ships, we'll sail to Lordaeron. We'll make landfall to the west and march back, catching the humans from behind. And then we'll crush them. The crowd cheered yet again, so loudly that the mountain itself seemed to cheer back at them. The rocks around them, even the stone beneath their feet, started shaking. The volcano speaks. The spirits within the mountain are pleased. They grant us their blessing. Doomhammer nodded and turned back to the crowd, all of which had started chanting his name over and over again. There was a feeling of elation and pride in the air. After everything the orcs had been through up to this point, it was about time they had something to cheer about, Orgrim thought. Tell us everything. Khadgar was currently stood in the council chambers of the Violet Citadel. He wasn't too fussed about the disguises and stuff. It was a little bit dramatic, yes, but also practical. For the leaders of the wizard community were chosen in secret to avoid any bribery or blackmail, that sort of thing. But it was also pretty obvious that some of the council members sort of reveled in the mysteriousness of it all and enjoyed the fact that any visitors to the chamber tended to leave looking ever so slightly confused by their experience. But Khadgar's appearance had also changed since the last time he was here, so it was entirely possible that some of the council members were just as bewildered by him as he was by them, so that was fun. But all that aside, Khadgar didn't particularly want to play these games. He was tired. He appreciated the council were interested in recent events, and they had a right to know, but it would be great if they could have this chat without all the posturing and performance and shit. Which is exactly why he glanced directly towards one of the wizards and said, I would be happy to recount events, Prince Kelthus, but it would be far easier were I able to see my audience properly. 
There was a bit of a gasp from one of the other figures, but the Alvin Prince simply chuckled. You are correct, young Khadgar. I'd find it difficult to speak to such shadowy figures myself. Is this better? With the quickest of gestures, the prince dismissed his disguise completely. Much better. Thanks. Khadgar then looked towards the rest of the cloaked figures expectantly, and they all just sort of fidgeted a little bit. Lord Krasus, Lord Kelthazard, may I not see your faces? At that, Antonidas laughed. He hadn't bothered wearing a disguise, since he was the one who invited Khadgar here in the first place. This matter is far too serious for such parlor tricks. He's no longer a whelp to be fooled and amazed by such slights. Unveil yourselves, my friends. Let us be to this matter before the night grows old. The other magi obeyed with a few grumbles, and now Khadgar could see all six of them clearly. Although that didn't mean he recognized all of them. He knew of Antonidas, obviously. He knew of the Prince, and Krasis, and Kelthazard. But the pudgy man, and the woman that could only be described as handsome, he did not know. We've done as you asked. Now tell us what happened. Well, what do you want to know? Everything. Very well. Kagar then proceeded to describe all of the things that had happened since he left Dalaran two years prior. His strange apprenticeship with Medivh, his mentor's mood swings and weird disappearances, his first encounter with the orcs, the wizard murders, and finally he told them about Medivh's betrayal, how he and Lothar had been forced to end the wizard's life. And then Kagar went on to tell them about the Siege of Stormwind, Lane's death, the city's conquest, and their subsequent flight north. And the council magi remained quiet the entire time, right up until Khadgar had seemingly finished talking, and there was an awkward silence for a moment. You forgot to mention the Order of Tirisfal. Antonidas let out a sharp cough, but Kalthazard persisted. What? Is it not relevant when discussing Medivh? It is. I apologize for my lapse, but I know little of the Order's true workings. Medivh did not name any other members or discuss its activities with me. The handsome woman and Kalthazard shared a look of frustration and disappointment with each other, and Khadgar breathed an internal sigh of relief. Good. He'd been right to opt for discretion. These folks knew nothing about the Order, and had merely hoped to trick him into revealing their secrets. I'm more concerned with Medivh himself, with what happened to him. You are certain it was Sargeras who saw within him? Absolutely. I'd already seen the Titan in a vision. So it was Medivh. Or Sargeras threw him, who opened a rift for the orcs. What did you say that world was called? Draenor. Khadgar shuddered a little bit. He still remembered that first vision he'd had in the tower. It had always filled him with a sort of comfort before, knowing he'd make old bones before his demise. But now that his body had been prematurely aged, it could happen any moment. It could happen this afternoon. What do we know of it? This world. He mentioned the sky was red. Can you tell us anything else? I haven't really been there. But a companion, a half-orc, told me a few things. The orcs were considerably more peaceful at home. They squabbled, but they didn't fight wars. Their only real enemies were the ogres. So what happened? They were corrupted. My companion didn't know all of the details, the why and the how of it, but she said their skin changed colour, from brown to green. They began practising different magic from what they'd known before. They turned more vicious, more violent. She talked about some ceremony in a chalice, and everyone drank some weird liquid, I don't know. But after that, they went even more blood crazy, killed any foe they encountered, and then turned on each other. And their magics leached the life from the soil itself. Just when it seemed like that might be it for the orcs, Medivh approached their chief warlock Gul'dan and offered him access to this world. They built a portal, sent a few clans through at a time, gradually increased their numbers. And now we have them approaching us at full force. Here. Yeah. Gagar then waited for further questions, but no one spoke. So eventually, well, if there's nothing more, noble gentleman and lady, I shall skedaddle. It's been a long day. What are your plans now? Gagar frowned. He'd been asking himself that very question. Part of him wanted to just resume his old job as an assistant to the librarian here in Dalaran. But the other part of him hated the idea of hiding from the upcoming conflict. He'd already faced a demon, a pretty important one at that, and survived. If he could handle that, he could handle anything. Besides, friendship, respect, loyalty still mattered in this world. I'll stand by Lord Lothar. I pledge my support and he richly deserves it. After the war, assuming we survive, I don't know. You're still a subject of Dalaran. If we called you back here and assigned you necessary work, would you obey? No, I can't return to that. After the war, I'll return to my studies. 
Whether I do that here or at Medivh's tower or some other location is entirely uncertain. Another awkward silence filled the room as everybody studied everybody until Krasis piped up. You left here a mere fledgling apprentice, but you've returned a master. You will not be ordered to do anything. We shall respect your wishes and your independence. However, we would appreciate it if you kept us up to date. So I'm free to go. Yes, you may go. Keep us informed. The sooner we know what's going on, the faster we can provide assistance. Of course. Can't go then buggered off, but as soon as the door shut behind him, he summoned a scrying sphere, because he had a feeling the conversation hadn't ended with his departure. And he was right. I don't know how far we can trust him. He didn't exactly seem eager to be here. Would you be? If you'd been through as much as he has? Besides, we don't need to trust him. We just need him to provide us with an introduction to Lothar and mediate between us and any others. We can at least trust him not to undermine our efforts, not to turn against us and not to withhold any information we might need. It's not like we need anything more from him than that. That other world he spoke of, Draenor, that troubles me. If the orcs could pass through that portal, others could have too, from either side. There could be even worse creatures waiting eagerly for their chance to devastate our world. And there's nothing to stop the orcs from retreating home whenever they feel it necessary. Fighting an enemy with an impregnable home base becomes considerably more difficult. They could pop out, attack and then disappear again. We should make finding and destroying that portal our first priority. Agreed. Destroy the portal. Glad that's settled. Anything else? The conversation then immediately turned to extremely boring crap like cleaning schedules, so Khadgar let the scrying spheres fade away. Well, that had gone a lot better than he'd expected. He thought the Kirin Tor was going to be furious with his lack of respect, but they seemed to actually be quite understanding, which was nice of them. Now, Khadgar just needed to teleport himself back to Capital City and go to bed. Hopefully, he'd be awake enough to be of any use tomorrow. A week later, Lothar stood in a command tent in Southern Lordaeron. Outside the tent, soldiers ran drills and stuff, and inside the tent, Lothar, the kings, and a few others stood around a table staring at a map. So a pretty stereotypical military camp, really. The discussion was the same one they'd been having for a week now. Which way was the Horde most likely to go? Where would they attack? And how would the Alliance troops prepare for it without trampling the very crops and fields they were trying to protect? Greymane was insisting for the tenth time now that the troops be stationed around his borders when suddenly a scout burst in. Sir, you have to see this. They're here. Who's here? The Elves, sir. The Elves are here. The Elves? Lothar took a moment to process that before glaring towards the kings, and just as he'd suspected, Terranus coughed and looked very guilty indeed. We need allies. The elves are a mighty race. I thought it best to contact them immediately, without consulting me. What if they'd sent an entire army, arrived announcing that they were in control? What if the horde attacks whilst we're still trying to assimilate them into our ranks? Don't conceal details like this from your military commander. Terranus nodded. You are correct. Of course. I should have consulted you first. It won't happen again. The fact that Terranus responded the way he did reminded Lothar of why he liked him so much. Most men find it difficult to accept fault, especially kings, but Terranus seemed to accept full responsibility. Fine. Let's go see what these elves look like then. Upon exiting the tent, the first thing Lothar saw were his own troops, and he couldn't help but feel a little bit proud and confident. Ain't nobody going to be able to stand against such a mighty force, he thought. But then he remembered the sight of the horde washing over Stormwind, and his confidence faded a little bit. Glancing past the troops, Lothar focused on the shore. He saw Proudmoor's ships anchored there, but he also saw a cluster of unfamiliar ships. Elven destroyers. Faster than our own, and lighter. They carry less weaponry, but make up for it with speed. An excellent addition to our forces, but it don't look like they've sent many. Looks like a single battle group. Perhaps more will follow. I wouldn't be their way. They'd all arrive together. A dozen ships is better than no ships. Plus whatever troops they were carrying as well. We should go and greet them. And so they did. As they approached the pier, a tall golden-haired figure leapt down from the deck above. And Lothar heard at least one person behind him gasp quite audibly. The figure then drew closer, and Lothar saw that it was a woman. A rather stunning one, at that. Milady. Welcome. I'm Anduin Lofa, commander of the Alliance of Lordaeron. The elven lady nodded. I'm Illyria Windrunner. I bring you greetings from Anisterian Sunstrider and the Council of Silvermoon. 
Thank you. Allow me to introduce the Kings of the Alliance, as well as my lieutenants. Nods and greetings were then exchanged, especially from Torellian. Now, forgive my bluntness, Lady Illyria, but um, is this all the aid your people can muster? I'll tell you straight, Lord Lothar. Anasterion and the others were little concerned by the reports you sent. This horde is far distant from us, and seems intent on conquering human lands, not our forests. The council members believe it would be better to leave this conflict to the younger races. And yet you're here, the missive from King Terranus. It informed us that you, Lord Lothar, are the last of the Arathi bloodline. Our ancestors pledged eternal support to King Thoradin, and all his kin. Anasterion could not deny that obligation, so we sent this battle group to acknowledge the debt. And what about you? I'm here of my own accord. I'm a ranger. I chose to bring my own detachment and offer our aid freely. I have a feeling this conflict is far more serious than my own rulers realize. If this horde is as vicious as you say, our forests will not remain safe for long. We must stop them. I agree. I thank your lords for their token support, but I'm far more grateful for your presence than that of your rangers. We were just discussing our next move. I'll be interested to hear your opinion. And, uh, once your people are settled, I would ask that you send them scouting. And we may be sure our enemy is not yet upon us. We need no rest. I'll send them at once. Illyria then gestured towards the other elves, and they buggered off. They'll scout and report back. If the Horde has come within two days' march of here, we will know of it. Excellent. Now, if you'd like to accompany us back to the tent, milady. Of course. But please, stop calling me milady. It's Illyria, nothing more. Lothar nodded and turned, and as he did, he caught a glimpse of Turalian's face and suppressed a grin. Now he knew where that gasp had come from. However, two days later, Lothar found he had nothing to smile about anymore, because Illyria's scouts had returned, as had Proudmoor's, and both had the same news to share. The Horde had taken Kazmadan. They'd crafted ships. Those ships were now carrying them swiftly across the water, aimed at the southern coast of Lordaeron. Seemed likely they'd come ashore in the Hillsbrad region. But if the Alliance were quick enough, they could have a force there waiting as the Horde arrived. Gather the troops. Leave everything non-essential. We can send people back for it later if we survive. Go! Lothar then turned to Khadgar. So it begins. I thought we'd have more time. So did I. But these Orcs are impatient to conquer. That might be their downfall. At least, I hope so. Ooh. What are you doing? I'm doing the, the war cry from The Last Airbender. I thought it would be cool. No one liked that movie. Stop embarrassing yourself. Are we ready? Ready, sir. Lothar nodded and turned away, and Torellian just kind of stood there, gulped, and worried if he'd done or said something wrong. Had Lothar wanted more detail? Was he supposed to do something now? Stop it, Torellian thought. Stop doubting yourself. Stop panicking. The only reason the commander is frowning is because we're about to go into battle. Not because of you. Ah, oh, balls. We're about to go into battle. Drellian then forced himself not to think about these things anymore. Wasn't really helping. So he decided to check his gear one more time. Straps were good and tight. His soft and squidgy parts were well protected. Everything was fine. He was ready. Or as ready as he could be, anyway. Nervous? Very. Drellian had been raised with the typical sense of respect but also wariness towards Magi. But Khadgar was different. He was down to earth. Unlike other wizards, the guy didn't act like his shit don't stink. Don't worry. Everyone's nervous. Trick is to just work past it. You're nervous too. Scared shitless, mate. Have been every time we're in combat. But Lothar once told me. You should be scared. The man that isn't afraid gets careless. And then he gets dead. My instructor said pretty much the same. It was one thing to say it, innit? Another to believe it. You'll be fine. Once it starts, you'll be too busy to think about it anyway. That conversation then abruptly ended, and the men looked out across the Hillsbrad region. It was named so for its rolling foothills, and the Alliance forces were currently spread across the last line of said foothills, facing South Shore and the Great Sea beyond. The Horde ships were visible on the horizon, massive ugly vessels, made of dark metal and blackened wood, certainly looked the part. It was Lothar's plan to meet the Horde as they landed, before the Orcs had a chance to regain their land legs. 
Proudmoor's navy had assaulted the ships as they'd made their passage, but a number of them had made it through, so there was still going to be quite the ground battle. They're almost ashore. First ready your men for the attack. Torellian nodded, but didn't dare speak, mainly because Illyria was the most beautiful thing he'd ever seen, and he was pretty sure any words he said would come out as either complete nonsense, or he'd just outright ask her to marry him or something. However, there did seem to be a slight glint in her eyes and a half smile on her face whenever she spoke to him, meaning she very likely knew and enjoyed just how uncomfortable she made him. But ain't nobody got time for that. Torellian turned to the unit leaders and gave them the go-ahead gesture, and they in turn gave orders to their heralds, who then blew battle horns, and after a few minutes of pointless unnecessary steps, the entire Alliance force was in motion, marching down the hill towards the shore. As they drew closer, Duralian saw one of the Horde ships beach itself, and even from here, he could see the creatures pouring from it were broadly built, with muscly arms and bandy legs, brandishing hammers and axes and spears and shears, and there were a lot of them. They've reached land. Charge! For Lordaeron! Lothar spurred his horse and took off, and Turalyon kicked his own steed into a gallop, and then the battle commenced. By the light, these monsters were ugly. Lothar and Khadgar had described them, but seeing them firsthand was something else entirely. Green skin, red eyes and tusks. Like boars, but with green skin and red eyes. And they were strong too, but fortunately they seemed to rely more upon that strength and their aggression than skill. So fighting them wasn't that bad, as long as you stayed switched on. A lull allowed Turalyon to gain his bearings somewhat. Lothar had cleared a number of orcs on his side. Uther was nearby, his own hammer crushing orcs left and right, and he was glowing. Some of the other Alliance forces were actively cheering for the Paladin, which didn't surprise Turalyon. Uther's faith was incredibly strong. However, things were not going quite as well as they seemed, because more Horde warships were approaching, with potentially thousands of orcs ready to pour forth from them and Duralian realised immediately that they were about to be extremely overwhelmed and outnumbered. Sir, we need to move back. At first, it seemed like Lothar was completely ignoring him, but the commander soon started barking orders. Uther, back to the others. The paladin liaison raised his hammer and obeyed, clearing a path through the orcs for the others to follow, and follow they did. There were a few moments where the young lieutenant thought the orcs would catch them and stop their retreat, but Illyria and her elven rangers provided much needed cover with their bows. So soon enough, Lothar, Uther, Turalyon and the other cavalry soldiers made it back to the main army. Form up, raise spears, link shields, repel them. The soldiers hurried to obey. Standing separately and working individually was not going to work against the Horde. The army needed to move together, work as one unified force and do that Spartan Roman thing with the shields and the spears and stuff. So they did that. The Horde crashed into the shield wall and although there were a few places where the Alliance Wall fell, much of it held, stopping the Orcs in their tracks. A second wave then crashed into the Shield Wall, collapsing a few more places, but again, it held, and the Orcs suffered more casualties from the spears sticking out of it. At this rate, as long as the Wall held, victory was in sight. But Orcs are bloody crafty buggers. After the third collision, they stopped doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, and instead, they fell back allowing something else to step forward onto their front line. A bunch of sinister looking hooded blokes carrying truncheons. And as they charged, many of the human soldiers that formed the shield wall suddenly fell to the ground, clutching their heads, screaming in agony, and spewing blood from their faces. By the light, abominations, and we will dark magics against us. Stand fast, soldiers. The holy light protects you. The glow then spread from Uther's hammer, shining down upon the Alliance's front line and bathing it in light. And this time, as the strange hooded monsters moved to charge again and raise their little enchanted sticks, the human soldiers did not fall or spew blood from their faces. The paladin's blessing had worked. The death knights then realised that they were kind of useless now, so they buggered off, being replaced on the front lines by a bunch of ogres instead, to act as big fleshy battering rams. Perhaps their brute strength could put even more of a dent in the alliance's shield wall. We cannot hold them for long. We need to keep them from reaching the hills. I'll do what I can. Khadgar, who had been busy fighting orc warlocks up to this point, not just standing around doing nothing, then looked up to the sky. And then there was a shattering boom, and a whole bunch of orcs went flying, burnt to a crisp. And then, the wizard went ahead and did that again, for a second time. And then a third time. Target the ogres! Alright, fine. This is quite taxing, you know. Khadgar managed one more lightning bolt strike directly on the ogres, before making it quite clear he had nothing left and needed to sleep. 
Hopefully, that would be enough. Ready the cavalry. And sound the charge. Charge? Into that, Turalyon thought. Ah, uh, what the hell. However, just before they could charge, drum beats sounded from somewhere within the horde, and the orcs began to fall back. We... We did it. They're retreating. But the orcs were not going back to their ships and cheesing it. Instead, they were marching east. They're headed to the hinterlands. Should we go after them? They're on the run. No. We blocked them in hell, but they're not running from us. They're going around us. Still, I guess that's something. In that case, we should go after them then, right? Before they find another place to stand. We should. But look behind you, Duralian. Duralian turned and immediately saw what Lothar was saying. Almost every human soldier was collapsing where they stood. Either from wounds or from sheer fatigue. We need to regroup and resupply. We're not in any shape to pursue them. No. But we've tested their forces. We've shown our men that we can stand against the Horde. This is a good thing. Well done, lad. Necros? Necros! Zuluhead, chieftain and shaman of the Dragonmoor clan, stomped through the corridors and gave any orc that dared get in his way a right dirty look. I'm here. What? Zuluhead approached his second and gave him a right dirty look as well. How goes the weapon, Necros? Is it ready? Come and see for yourself. Necros then turned and limped off, with Zuluhead following, muttering to himself. He hated this place. Grim Batol, the dwarves had called it, with its low ceilings and its even lower door frames. But at least, as the fortress was carved into a mountain, it was sturdy and easily defended. So it was alright, he supposed. After a few more moments of walking and mumbling, the two then arrived into a vast underground chamber, and there, chained to the wall by links of dark iron, was a sight that still made Zulohead feel a little bit uneasy. A large beast, red as blood, red as flame, a dragon. And not just any dragon either. This was Alexstrasza, the greatest of the red dragons, the mother of her flight, and queen of her people. Perhaps the most powerful creature in this world. And yet, the Dragonmoor clan had somehow captured her. Well, Necros had captured her. Flashback time. The clan had been searching for a dragon for weeks. Any dragon would have done. And one day, they spied a lone male with a wounded wing flying above a forest. So they followed it back to its lair. And the lair was kind of surrounded by red dragons flying around like birds. So the Dragonmoor orcs watched the lair for several days because they had no bloody idea what to do next. Until finally, Necros arrived, announcing he'd tamed the demon soul. So the orcs then very cautiously entered the lair and to their surprise, they found the Dragon Queen. Alexstrasza, hanging about with her three husbands. She noticed them immediately and killed four orcs in an instant, but Necros then stepped forward by himself and ordered Alexstrasza to follow him. And to everyone's surprise, she did, as did all of her husbands. Needless to say, the rest of the clan had started singing songs about Necros ever since. The orc that single-handedly cowed an entire dragon flight. But Necros wouldn't have even been able to do it without Zulihead. I found that artifact. Should have been me that was able to wield it. The chieftain thought. Not my peg-legged apprentice. But the demon soul had refused to respond to Zuluhead and his shamanic magic. It only answered to Necros. But on the plus side, that meant Necros was stuck down here in these caves, while Zuluhead could continue fighting for the Horde. And Necros was fine with that arrangement as well. Ever since a human had severed his leg below the knee, he'd become quite useless in combat anyway. Zuluhead then started to step forward. So, have we- Wait. Necros then pulled the demon soul from a pouch and held the disc aloft. Go. The disc then kind of sparked, with the sparks coalescing into a shape. The shape of a bloke, powerfully built and wearing strange armour. Its eyes were balls of black fire. We will enter. The creature then burst into sparks again, and Necros turned to his chieftain and nodded. So Zulu Head resumed his advance, a little bit more cautiously this time, because he had no idea what that was all about. Have you come to gloat then, little orc? Have you not tormented me and my children enough? Not to gloat, just here to make sure all is arranged. You understand what will happen if you refuse us? That has been made abundantly clear. Alex Rouser then turned her gaze to the far corner of the chamber. A handful of pale objects lay clustered there. The remains of dragon eggs, smashed, in order to ensure her compliance. You will not succeed. You have chained me, but my children will defy you and win their freedom. Not while we have this. Necros raised the demon soul, and the Dragon Queen's body arced in pain. I will kill you someday. Perhaps. But until then, you and yours will serve the Horde. The two orcs then left that chamber, 
and made their way to another one, one that opened out along the side of the mountain, providing a view of the many other red dragons circling the fortress. Release her! Release our mother! Never! Again, Necros raised the demon soul, and the dragons in the sky kind of spazzed out a little bit. Your mother is our captive, as are her mates. They will remain so. You, all of her children, will serve us. Serve the Horde, or she will die screaming for the pain you just felt. And without her, your flight will die. For without Alex Straza, there will be no more red dragon hatchlings. You'll be the last of your kind. The dragons cried out in anger, but the Dragonborn Chieftain knew they would obey. They had no choice. Now, all they needed to do was fashion some leather straps and reins and seats and stuff, and then the Horde would own the skies. This was their secret weapon. The humans had troops and cavalry and ships, but they could not take to the air. Fire would rain down upon them, destroying them and their equipment, and there was absolutely nothing they could do about it. This was going to make the Horde invincible. There! Thane! Look there! Kurdren Wildhammer, chief Thane of the Wildhammer clan, wheeled his griffin Skyri around and looked to where Farrand was pointing. Aha! Movement! Figures! Traipsing through the forest! Be them trolls? They were certainly the same shade of green as trolls. But no, these figures walked the ground rather than skimming the branches Tarzan style, and their footsteps were too heavy, too loud, too careless to be those bummels from the forest that the dwarves hated ever so much. Gurdrin tapped Skyrie with his heels, and the griffin cawed lightly in response before diving down a little bit for a closer look. And as Thane caught a clear view of one of the creatures, he frowned. What the bloody hell was that? Heavily built, heavily armed. Whatever it was, it was equipped for war. So Kurdrin pulled back on the reins and Skyrie retreated a little bit. Back to the others. I told you. Uglies. In our forest. Aye. You're right. They are ugly. And they're intriguing. There'll be a lot of them though. And they'll be hard to hit as long as they stay beneath the trees. Are we just to let them traits across our lands then? Oh no. We'll just have to be scaring them out into the open. Come on lads. Let's get back home. Don't worry. I have a few ideas. We'll soon make it clear to these greenskins they kinda just waltz through the hinterlands. You there. Paladin. Trillian glanced up to see an elf ranger approaching. He hadn't seen or heard their approach, but he was used to them sneaking up by now. Yeah. The orcs are in the hinterlands. And they're meeting up with the trolls there. Trillian noted the hint of disgust in that last part. Elves hated trolls. That much was obvious. You're certain they're allies? Not just crossing paths? Of course I'm sure. I heard them talking. They've got a pact of some sort. They're planning on attacking Airy Peak. And then moving up into Quel'Thalas. Oh, that explained why the elf was a little bit agitated. I'll let Lothar know. Don't worry. We'll stop them before they can get anywhere near your homeland. The ranger nodded, though he didn't exactly look convinced. But he then buggered off, and Duralian decided that now would be a good time to go join the others. So he did. The orcs are planning to attack Airy Peak. One of the rangers just told me. They've allied with the forest trolls as well. Lothar nodded, and then turned his focus back to the ever-present map on the table. It'll be tough, taking the fight to them in the forest. We'll be forced to leave our ballista behind. Then again, they'll not be able to marshal their forces well either. We could pick off small groups of orcs without having to worry about them sending their entire army to one location. Dwarves would make strong allies. If we help them, they may agree to help us in return. We could certainly use them and their griffins. Lothar then looked up at Turalyon. Rally the troops. We're headed into the forest to save the dwarves. Wildhammers, attack! Kurdren Wildhammer blew a blast on his horn, and the Wildhammer's first ambush commenced. But instead of diving down to attack the Greenskins directly, Kurdren unsheathed his Stormhammer and started striking the trees. And as he did, leaves, berries and needles rained down on the orcs below. And they didn't quite know what to make of all of this, all they knew for certain was that there was a sudden onslaught of foliage dropping down on them and they didn't like it at all. So they cheesed it a little bit, headed towards the nearest small clearing, which was exactly what Kurdren had planned for them to do. As the first greenskin entered the clearing, he had just about enough time to look up and see a large hammer flying directly towards his face. You're too ugly to be in me forest, you bastard! The hammer made its way back to Kurdren's hand, and he loosed it again, smashing a second orc, and then a third, and the rest of his lads were striking as well. So the forest was filled with the sounds of orcs being smashed and getting really annoyed about this whole situation. The skirmish was over pretty quickly. Whatever these creatures were, they were slow and not used to facing an airborne attack. 
That taught him to look up. We'll send out another team soon. Mayhap they'll learn to give Airy Peak a way to birth. Get ready. They should be close by. Trillian and Cadgar nodded as the paladin and wizard strained their eyes, trying to pierce the gloom of the trees and stuff. There. Trillian pointed, and both Lothar and Cadgar followed his gesture and saw a flicker of movement. Too low to be a bird and too steady to be a snake, or an insect, or whatever. It was definitely something the size of a man walking through the forest. Got him. Cadgar, let the others know. We'll keep watch in the meantime. Lothar then turned to look at Turalyon directly. If they look like they're getting away, we'll just have to give them a reason to turn back this way again, eh? Yes, sir. Turalyon grinned. He was ready this time. Sure, he was still nervous, but he no longer worried about freezing up or turning tail. He could do this. We've lost Tialak. Angus as well. And two more that are too winded to continue fighting. What happened? The Greenskins, that's what. They were ready for us. They've learned, Thane. The ugly buggers have learned. So they ain't stupid then. Well, we'll just have to hit them before they can react. Tell the lads to come in fast and hard. They're working against gravity and we're working with it. We've got the advantage. Ironman nodded, but before he could say anything, another dwarf named Beethan burst in. Trolls! We were diving on the greenskins when a pack of forest trolls jumped us. Took out Marie and Sigurgadirga. Damn. So they're teamed with the trolls then. Greenskin and greenskin. Those trolls will keep us from using the trees. We need something to even the odds and fast. As if to answer that statement, a third dwarf burst in. This one called Dermid. Humans, a great mass of them. They say they've come to fight off the greenskins. <laughs> they call them orcs. Ancestors be praised. If they can keep them busy enough to forget about their new tactics, we can strike them down from above again. Kirdrin turned towards the door, already whistling for Skyri. Wild Hammoth, let's fly. Now! Lothar spurred his mount and charged, bursting upon a pack of orcs, and they all jumped, clearly surprised, because they'd been too busy watching the skies for an attack from above. So the champion and Turalyon made quick work of them. But the young paladin then heard a strange noise, and as he looked up, he saw a tall figure, Taller than any orc, but more narrowly built. A troll. The creature then pounced with its spear, but Turalyon raised his shield and responded with a fierce blow of his own. And before the troll had any time to recover, Turalyon smashed it again right in the face. And it was dead. And Turalyon felt really pleased with himself. For all of about five seconds before he noticed a second troll, ready to throw a spear directly towards him. He didn't have time to raise his shield or dodge, so he closed his eyes, preparing himself for the worst. But instead of immense pain followed by death, he heard a shriek and opened his eyes to see something amazing. The second troll was dead, and above it hovered a majestic creature. And mounted atop that was a little bearded muscly bloke. The dwarf saw Turalyon looking and grinned, and Turalyon grinned back. With the dwarf's assistance, the humans would no longer have to worry about ambushes from above. They could concentrate on the orcs. This was going to be a piece of piss. A few hours later, Kurdran Wildhammer welcomed the human leaders into his home. The fighting was finally over. Greetings, laddies and lass. You're welcome indeed. We feared those beasties had us beat, but your arrival put an end to that. I'm in your debt. You lead the wild hammers. Aye, I'm Kurdjan Wildhammer, Chief Thane. Good, I'm Anduin Lothar, former Knight of Stormwind and now commander of the Alliance forces. Lothar then explained about the Horde, his city's fate and all the other stuff. Will you join us? They say they wish to conquer all lands, and they came here on great black iron ships, and they've been through Kazmadan. They've not heard from our kin in Iron Forge for weeks. This explains why. They conquered the mines, used the iron ore for their ships. Aye, we wild hammers have had many quarrels with the Bronzebeard clan over the years. That's why we left there in the first place. But they're still our cousins. These foul creatures attacked them, now they've attacked us. If it weren't for your timely aid. Aye, big fella, we will join you. Kurdrin extended his hand to Lothar, and the champion accepted the clasp. Thank you. At least we've driven them from the hinterlands. Your home is safe. For now. What about the rest of them? Up north. What did you say? Up north? My scouts say we only saw a fraction of the horde here. The rest turned north. You didn't know this. Lothar then cursed loudly. A faint. And we fell for it. Uh, excuse me. My home was at risk. 
This was no mere ploy. No, the threat was real. But whoever commands the Horde is smart. They knew we'd stop to aid you here. And now they've got distance on us. And they're headed for Quel'Thalas. We have to warn them. We'll rally the troops and set off again. If we move fast, there's no time. You said yourself the Horde now has distance on us. We've lost days already. I'll go myself. No, you'll not go alone. Drellian, take the rest of the cavalry and half the troops. They're in charge. Kadgar, you go with him. Lothar then turned back to Kurdren, who was visibly impressed by the champion. There'll still be orcs left in the forest. I can't risk letting them get behind us as well as in front. I'll stay and make sure the forest is clean. Then we'll move forward and rejoin the others. Thank you for your aid. When my forests are once again secured, my warriors and I will accompany you north. Thank you. Well, what are you still doing here? Get moving. Keep them moving. We need to get through these pigs quickly. Why? What do you mean? Why what? Why are we climbing? We could have gone around these mountains instead. Why are we taking this route? Scaling these peaks will slow us down. Doomhammer grunted and then turned to face Rend and the other chieftains. The humans think us stupid. They imagine us as dumb brutes, just as we see ogres. I encourage that image. Let them think us brainless. It only makes our conquest easier because they underestimate us. Ren's brother, Mame, then piped up. But we are headed to Kalthars, are we not? Why didn't we just sail there? Would have landed long before the humans emerged from the hinterlands. Zuljin said the elves are expert archers. We would have been trapped in our ships whilst they rained down arrows upon us. And we would have lost thousands, entire clans, before our ships even made it to shore. But we could have marched around the mountains. <laughs> are you afraid of a challenge, Rend? Of course not. I'm up to the task. I was right behind you the entire climb, wasn't I? Oh, then you do wish to challenge. Doomhammer's change in tone caused Ren to back away slightly. Both the Black Hand brothers wished to lead the Horde, but they'd have to challenge and defeat Doomhammer in combat in order to achieve that. And they knew full well they'd lose that fight. Everybody knew it. He'd kill them even if they rushed him at the same time. Bunch of losers. But once Doomhammer realised Ren wasn't going to take the bait, and felt slightly disappointed by that, he continued. Going around might have been faster, but our movements would have been more visible. This way we catch the elves unawares. If the humans survive their battle in the hinterlands and march around the mountains, they may well arrive at Quelth the last before us. And then, if the elves allow them entry, they'll all be gathered together like sitting ducks when we attack. And if not, if they're still behind us, then they'll find us already established in Quelth the last when they arrive. Either way, we win. The crowd murmured, with several of them laughing and grinning, and even Rend Blackhand nodded. You are wise, War Chief. This is a good plan. I know. Now let's move on. There are still several peaks to cover. But before setting off, Orgrim turned to Zuluhead. Where are they? On their way. Don't worry, they're swift. They'll reach us soon. And then the world will tremble at the sight of them. Doomhammer nodded, and then turned to Zul'jin. How far to Quelth, alas? Four days travel at this pace. But my people could be there sooner. No, you stay with us. Don't worry, you'll get your chance to attack the Elven homeland. But not until the Horde is right behind you. Zul'jin pondered this for a moment, but seemed to accept it. And then finally, the Horde continued their march. Four days later, the Horde had reached the final peak of the mountains. Beyond was the start of the Great Forest. We be going now? Yeah, go now. Bring the fight to the elves. Spare no one. Zul'jin grinned, and then tilted his head back to let loose a weird warble sound. And then a whole bunch of other forest trolls appeared in the small valley below. It was full of the buggers. There were far more than Doomhammer remembered Zul'jin bringing with him. <laughs> far more. With the Bark tribe. They'd be joining us. Alright then. Doomhammer wasn't going to argue with that. A whole bunch of additional troops that all absolutely hated elves. Yes please. But the time for waiting and chats was over. Zul'jin howled and raced down the hill, with his followers and the new additional trolls charging into the forest as well. The forest defenders would soon rush to meet these invading assholes, which would keep them too busy to check their borders for any other threats. This was the plan. Doomhammer then signalled, and the horde began its own march towards the forest. But rather than entering it, the orcs simply reached the first row of trees, raised their axes, and got to work, chopping and stuff. With each tree that fell, 
the elves would be deprived of protection. Plus, the wood they'd gather would keep the Horde's fires burning for weeks. A short time later, Doomhammer stood and observed the work progress when he noted motion in his periphery. And as he turned, he grunted to himself in annoyance because Gul'dan was approaching and he looked pretty excited about something. <sighs> what? Something you should see, mighty Doomhammer. Something that could aid the Horde greatly. So, the war chief followed the warlock until they reached a big rock carved with strange symbols. What is that? I'm not sure exactly. A rune stone. I believe it part of a greater collection, serving as a mystic barrier. Well, not much of a barrier. Didn't stop us. No, because we use nothing more than our hands and feet and blades. These rune stones restrict the use of magic within, most likely only allowing the elves to use it. Watch. Gul'dan waved his arms about and nothing happened, but he then strolled ten paces away, waved his arms about again. This helps us how exactly? These stones contain immense power. Power that I can harness for our own purposes. Doomhammer raised an eyebrow at Gul'dan. He knew better than to give the old prick free reign. I can use them to create an altar of storms. By channeling the energies within, I can transform creatures. Make them more powerful, more dangerous. Though they may suffer some disfigurement. Now Walk will let you experiment on them a second time. At that, Gul'dan smiled, almost as if that was exactly what he'd expected Orgrim to say. I will not use it on the orcs. I'll use a creature that would barely notice any reduction to intellect. Ogres. Doomhammer considered that. They didn't have a lot of ogres in their ranks, but the idea of making those few even stronger was very tempting indeed. It was definitely worth the risk. Alright, build one of these altars. We'll see what it does. If it works, I'll supply you with more rogues, and any other race you wish. You need to pick up the pace. We're moving as fast as we can. You know our men can't match your speed? Then I'll go on myself, as I should have from the start. Illyria tensed, ready to sprint off, but no. Something in Torellian's voice stopped Illyria, and she cursed under her breath. Why couldn't she disobey him? Why was he so goddamned irresistible? Let me go. I need to warn them. Illyria's heart twisted at the thought of her sisters and her friends and her kin all being caught unawares by the Horde. We will warn them. We will help them stand against the Horde. But if you go by yourself, you'll be caught and killed. And that, well, that won't do anyone any good. It had sounded as if Torellium was going to say something else. And for a moment, Illyria felt something else in her heart. Was that joy? What ifs? Ain't nobody got the time for that. I'm an elf and a ranger. I can disappear into the trees. No one can find me. Not even a forest troll. Because we know they're working with the Horde. I'm better than a troll. No one would deny that. But we don't know how many of them there are out there. Between us and your home. Ten of them would more than make up for your superior skill. Illyria cursed under her breath again. The wizard knob was right. She knew it. Just get them moving. Illyria then buggered off to scout the path ahead. She's worried. Yeah. No shit. Who can blame her? The Horde's marching on her home. She's only got half the Alliance army at her back, with me commanding it. Stop selling yourself short, Torellian. You're a good commander, and a noble paladin. She's lucky to have you. Torellian smiled at his friend, grateful for the reassurance. Didn't exactly believe it, though. He was decent enough in combat, sure. But a leader? Nah. Before this war, he'd never led anything. Not even prayers. Why did Lothar choose me, and not Uther? It was a question Torellian often asked himself. Uther was strong, powerful, pious. Hell, it was probably his faith that made him so. Torellian believed in the Holy Light, of course. Had done since he was a kid. But seeing this horde, this terrible, monstrous darkness, it did raise a few questions. Either the Holy Light was not as strong as Torellian had believed, or it was not universal, as he'd been taught. He's gone quiet again. I'm fine. Just thinking about what to do next. What do you mean? Everything's going fine. Keep the men moving. Make the best time we can. Hope we catch up with the Horde before they do too much damage. I know. I just wish there was a way for us to reach Quel'Thalas first. Maybe Illyria's right. Maybe I should let her go on ahead. But if anything happened to her, I... Torellian then glanced at Khadgar to see he was grinning. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all. About two weeks later, we're almost there. 
Yeah, I know. This is my home, remember? I know it better than you do. To Alien's side, it had been a long two weeks. Leading the army had been demanding. He'd hardly slept the entire time due to all the pressure and stress. And then there'd been Illyria, who'd literally questioned every decision the whole way. We'll reach the base of the foothills soon. Once we have, we should be able to see the borders of Quel'Thalas. Then we'll know how far the Horde has gone. Once I see the forest, I'm going on ahead. Don't try to stop me. I don't want to stop you. I want you and your rangers to find your brethren and warn them. I just didn't want you possibly running into the entire Horde on the way. But we're close enough now that if the Horde did get here first, we'll be able to distract them. That'll give you time to slip past and rally your kin. Illyria nodded, glanced up at Turalyon silently, and then laid a hand on his leg. The touch itself felt like it radiated the heat of a small sun to Turalyon. Then he got an erection. But one of the other rangers then appeared out of nowhere and ruined the whole moment. The end of the hills lies just ahead. I can see the troops beyond. Illyria turned and raced away, the other ranger right beside her. But they didn't get very far. Both elves were still in sight when they stopped, and Illyria let out a scream that was jam-packed full of a whole bunch of grief. And as Torellian raced to her side, he saw what had upset them so. Smoke, billowing out from several spots around the forest. The Horde had arrived before them, and they were burning Quel'Thalas. We have to stop them. We need to stop them. We will. Torellian then turned to one of his heralds and formed the unit leaders. We ride north until we're level with the orcs. Then we charge. Warn the men to gather water as best they can, and order several units to focus on putting out the fires. We don't want the forest burning down around us. The herald saluted and buggered off, and Duralian then turned to Khadgar. What about you? Can you do something about the fires? Will a thunderstorm suffice? As long as the lightning doesn't hit any more trees, yes. Illyria. Illyria! Illyria snapped out of her grief stupor, and faith Duralian. Take your rangers and go. Your brethren are no doubt already fighting the Horde. Find them. Let them know we're here. We need to coordinate our attacks. Go! And so she did, as did all the other elven rangers. May the Holy Light protect you. May it protect us all. We we'll certainly need it. Quiet now. No noise. So Jin and his small troll army had made their way stealthily somehow through the trees of the forest of Quel'Thalas. But... The Amani chieftain's sharp nose had warned him that elves were somewhere nearby, and he didn't want the elves to know they were here yet, which is why he'd hushed everybody and they weren't charging anymore. But you could feel the anticipation in the air. This was it, the elven homeland. These bastards had plagued the trolls for far too long, ever since they'd first appeared thousands of years ago. This was all part of the Amani Empire, and then they'd showed up with their bloody magic and just taken it. Ignorant twats. And if that wasn't bad enough, the elves then allied with the humans and shattered the Amani Empire completely. Slaughtered thousands. And the Amani tribe never recovered, really. Now it was just a shadow of its former greatness. But the Horde had promised them vengeance. They would stay true to their word. Doomhammer wouldn't lie. He was honourable and stuff. And so, understandably, after everything I just said, Zor'jin and the other trolls were all really bloody excited at the moment. Zor'jin peered down through the leaves. There, a flicker of movement cloaked in browns and greens. An elf. Another then emerged behind it, and then a third, and a fourth. It was a hunting party, and they had absolutely no idea that a small army of trolls were hanging about right above their heads, until it was too late. Zor'jin and his brethren fell down upon them, and with the element of surprise, the skirmish was over pretty quickly. The troll chief then kneeled, but only to cut an ear off an elf he'd slain, not to, like, honour the fallen or anything. He then added the ear to a pouch round his waist, He'd make a necklace later on out of it, he thought. But for now, more elves be coming. Back to the trees. We lead them on a chase, keep them busy, and then we kill them all. Meanwhile, is it ready? Chogol grunted and shoved, pushing the last runestone fragment along the floor into place, and then turned to the very impatient looking Gul'dan and nodded. Good. It had taken long enough. Several hours to dig out a single runestone, shatter it, and then carry the enormous pieces here. And then it had taken several more hours to position the runestone fragments correctly, inscribe the relevant sigils and pentagrams and shiz. Obviously Gul'dan didn't lift a finger to help with any of this, and maybe speed up the entire process. That's what Cho'Gall and the other ogres were for. That was their job. But now that everything was in place, Gul'dan gestured, and Cho'Gall turned to some of the ogres that had helped with constructing all of this, and told them to now stand exactly where he was pointing. And so they did. Gul'dan then raised his arms, called forth the dark energies his demon masters had granted him back on Draenor, 
and soon enough, all five fragments of the rune stone began to hum. The air itself seemed to darken around the altar of storms, thick with energy, and that energy then coalesced and shot from the stones directly into the ogres. And then boof, like a flashbang went off or something. As the glow faded and dimmed, Gul'dan regained his senses and got his first real look at the creature his altar had created. It was still an ogre, but now it had two heads. Back on Draenor, two-headed ogres were incredibly rare. In fact, Jogol had been the first one in quite a while. But now it seemed he wasn't alone. What am I? You were an ogre. Perhaps an ogre mage. An ogre mage? What does that mean? So Gul'dan explained about magi and warlocks and shaman and magic and stuff. And I am one of these. Possibly. There is a simple test. Gul'dan then stooped, picked up a leaf and handed it to the two-headed creature. Take this. Concentrate on the idea of fire, of heat and flame. So the ogre frowned with both faces, as if it was concentrating really hard. Good. Now bring that flame to life. Let it claim the leaf. Feel the heat warming your skin, almost burning your fingers. The leaf then burst into flame, and the ogre glanced up, looking really pleased with itself. I am an ogre mage then. Yes, you are one of us. What does that mean? One of us. Gul'dan then explained about the Horde, the need to conquer this world, the other races that were their enemies, and both ogre heads listened quietly and intently. You created me, so I will serve you. Your cause is my cause. Tell me what to do. Inside, Gul'dan rejoiced. This was exactly what he was hoping would happen. By shaping the two-headed ogre with his own magic, he'd formed a bond between them. As far as Doomhammer knew, Gul'dan was providing him with bigger, stronger warriors. But the Warchief had no idea that these new warriors would be completely and utterly loyal to Gul'dan. Not the Horde. Not Doomhammer. Gul'dan. Everything was going exactly according to plan. <laughs> Valyria raced through the forest, with branches and twigs slapping against her face. But she didn't give a shit, because she was too busy thinking about how the outskirts of her homeland were on fire. About the safety of her people. And not for the first time, she was thinking about how she wished she'd never left home. <laughs> Why had she decided to help the Alliance? Anasterion and the other council members were far older and wiser than she was. Maybe she should have just listened to them. But no, she thought. Anasterion had also believed that the Horde would never pose a threat to Quell Thalas. And he'd definitely been wrong about that. <laughs> but that didn't change the fact that if she had listened to him, she would have been here when the Horde arrived. And yes, maybe one ranger wouldn't have made the slightest bit of difference. But she wouldn't now feel as if she'd deserted her family and her people when they needed her most. Those thoughts spurred Illyria to even greater speed. And as she leapt over an entire bush into a clearing, she suddenly found herself staring down the tip of a hunting arrow aimed at her throat. However, Illyria would recognize that shiny silvery white hair anywhere. Farisa, Illyria, you're home. Are you all right? Where's Sylvanas? Her mother and father safe. They're fine. Sylvanas is with a hunting party near the riverbank. As for mother and father, they should be in Silvermoon by now. Illyria, where have you been? What's going on? There's fires all over, and some of the rangers haven't reported back. Illyria felt her stomach twist at that. If some of the rangers were missing, that could only mean that the Horde had penetrated deeper into the forest than she'd thought. We're being invaded, little sister. Illyria's ears then twitched, and she turned, sword in hand, just in time to impale a lunging troll that appeared out of nowhere. We need to move. Now. And so they did. <laughs> Illyria was certain she could hear laughter above them. The creatures were following them, on the branches above. No doubt planning to drop down and kill them both. But Illyria knew these woods. She knew them better than anyone. So she led the way, with her sister keeping pace behind her. And the two of them ran and twisted and turned and did flips and all sorts of things. Until eventually, Illyria saw it. The river. And she knew the trolls were beginning to drop down directly behind them, desperate to reach the two elves before they could wade into the water and float away. Because trolls hate water, apparently. Nice chase, pale one. But now you die. Illyria narrowly avoided the hand grasping at her hair from behind, but as she span around, ready to fight, the troll stiffened and fell to the ground, with an arrow sticking out of its neck. More arrows then flew overhead, striking the rest of the trolls, and Illyria looked back towards the river to see another familiar face. Welcome home, sister. Now what is this trouble you've brought us? Even from across the river, the figure radiated intensity, 
The kind that suggested that someday, in the future, she'd be focused on so much as a character that some people will start to get a little bit bored and annoyed by her. I did not bring it, Sylvanas. I had hoped to outrun it. But I do bring possible salvation. I must speak with the Council. I don't know if they'll listen. Too busy worrying about these fires to consider much else right now. As am I. They will listen. I'll give them no choice. What is the meaning of this? Anasterian Sunstrider and the Council of Silvermoon had been discussing matters in low, serious voices when Illyria just waltzed in unannounced. I am Illyria Windrunner. I've been beyond our borders and have been fighting alongside the humans in their war. But now I return to bring you grave tidings. Not just for them, but for us. The horde that the humans warned us of is real and vast and powerful. The bulk of their forces are orcs, but they have other creatures as well, including the forest trolls. That last bit got a reaction. A whole bunch of angry murmurs and mears. Trolls, you say? Heh. <laughs> Let those foul creatures follow the horde. Maybe these orcs you speak of will do us a favour and take them all far away from here. You don't understand. The horde is not some distant threat anymore. The trolls have entered our forests. Already they stalk through our lands and are killing our people. Here? Impossible. In answer, Illyria swung an object towards the Elven King. A severed troll's head. That one attacked me and my sister. Not an hour's run from the river crossing. Several more followed us there. Their bodies still lie on the bank unless Sylvanas and her party have moved them. They're here, within our woods, killing our people. And the orcs are the ones burning the edges of the forest. Outrageous! However, this time, the king's outburst was not directed at Illyria. He had a little strop and kicked the troll's head away, and you could see in his eyes that he was absolutely fuming. They dare to invade our home, gather our warriors, summon the rangers. We'll drive them from our forest so sternly that they'll never dare encroach again. Illyria was pleased to see her king acting so determined, but still, she shook her head anyway. The horde is numerous beyond belief. The orcs are strong and powerful. Fortunately, I did not come alone. Meanwhile, Duralion, who had just finished killing a whole bunch of orcs, took a second to peer up at the dark, thick clouds that hung above. The rain showed no sign of letting up, but that was a good thing, because the fires were out. Khadgar had absolutely outdone himself summoning this storm. Literally. Poor Bass was absolutely exhausted now. Duralion then turned to face a new pair of orcs on his left flank, but they immediately killed over, and Illyria appeared from behind them. I see I got here just in time. What exactly do you do when I'm not around to save you? <laughs> I manage. Did you find them? I did. And they've agreed. The warriors and rangers are mobilising. They can be here in ten minutes. If here is where you want them, here's as good a place as any. I'll run back and inform them. You just hold fast until they arrive. Please. We will hold. Don't worry. Another meanwhile, deep in the forest, a particular subordinate of Zul'jin's, Turlidge, peered through the foliage and grinned. He'd caught sight of his prey. The elf was moving pretty quickly for one of its kind, but Turlidge dropped down and ambushed the bugger. However, the elf didn't look scared. It looked pleased. Did you think I could not hear you rustling about above? You're not welcome here, creature, and you will not be suffered to live. Very clever. But Turlidge ain't scared of one little elf with one little stick. Now, Turlidge was a seasoned hunter and warrior. He wasn't scared. This was going to be easy peasy. So he raised himself up to his full height, leapt forward towards his foe, and died mid-air, impaled on a spear. Rest in peace, Turlidge. Alderaan. Nice one. I've spoken with the Alliance commander, and with Sylvanas as well. She needs all our forces along the southwest edge of the forest. Alright. All of the Mar and his men are nearby, I'll let them know. Are you well, Illyria? You seem flushed. I'm fine. Go. And a third meanwhile, back with Turalyon. Bloody hell, you were only gone a few minutes. Well, I'm back now. They're on their way. Duralion felt a surge of relief, not entirely sure whether it was at the thought of reinforcements or the fact that Illyria was safe, but whatever. However, that slight feeling of elation was immediately interrupted, as Duralion noticed a dark shape looming up and getting bigger and bigger. What? What are you staring at? That. <laughs> the hell is that thing? An ogre. A two-headed one. Duralion was about to thank Khadgar for pointing out the obvious things that everyone could quite clearly see for themselves, but the beast then raised his hand, and boof, fire popped out. Oh shit. It's an ogre mage. You what? A wizard. A bloody ogre wizard. Great. Not only was this the largest, strongest beast that Turalyon had ever seen, but it cast magic as well. Fantastic. How the bloody hell were they going to kill this thing? 
However, before Turalyon could ask Khadgar that question, the two-headed ogre fell flat on its face and didn't get up again. And Deliria broke the stunned silence by cheering and raising her bow high in salute. My people have arrived. They have excellent timing. Right, tell your people to spread out along the edges of the forest. We'll go the other way and do the same. Then we'll meet in the middle, crush the horde whilst also preventing their escape. Illyria nodded and then started doing all sorts of hand gestures towards the forest. Some kind of elf hunter sign language or something. And Khadgar turned to the human unit leaders and started shouting orders as well. Sometime later, both the human and elven forces had done the thing, Torellian suggested, and the fighting had now commenced. And Torellian's plan was working out better than he'd even hoped. The orcs had only braced themselves for the charging human soldiers. They'd been caught completely unawares by the elven warriors from behind, and the alliance were actually winning, despite the fact the orcs massively outnumbered them. But Torellian then heard a loud roar, and as he turned, his stomach clenched. More two-headed ogres. A whole bunch of them. Where the bloody hell were these things even coming from? Any ideas, Khadgar? Khadgar started to reply, but Illyria interrupted him. Listen, for what? Can't hear anything except fighting. What is he? Illyria then grinned. Help from above. It don't matter how big they are. The wild hammers can bring him low. What you waiting for, lads? I've shown you how it's done. Let's make sure the rest of these giants come crashing down as well. The rest of the griffin riders in the sky saluted and got to work, launching their own storm hammers and shiz, and Kurdrin waved down towards the mage, elf and commander below that he'd met back at Airy Peak. Or down there, your Lord Lothar sent us. Just in time, looks like. The battle continued, with the Alliance forces filled with a renewed sense of vigour, thanks to the little muscly bearded reinforcements, whilst the orcs were now in full-blown panic mode. However, things were not over yet. The Horde still had another thing up their sleeve. Something shifted in the wind, and Kurdrin glanced to see a dark shape gliding on the horizon. At first, he thought it was just another of his warriors, but then he realised it weren't no griffin. Was it a bird? Was it an airship? No. Dragon! One of the other wild hammers named Murkad looked where Kurdrin was pointing, and like a complete moron, he kicked his griffin, let out a fierce yell, and charged directly towards the approaching monstrosity, and then disappeared because the dragon opened its mouth and ate him. Rest in peace, Murkad. More dragons then appeared in the sky, a whole gaggle of them. The colour of flame, by the light. Pull back! Away from the forest, now! Illyri looked at Turalyon, puzzled. Turalyon knew exactly what was about to happen, but there was absolutely no time to explain. Just do it! Tell your people to fall back towards the hills! Hurry! Something in his voice convinced Illyria, so she turned and signalled to the other elven warriors and Turalyon raced towards the first human officer he could find, and then started to cheese it himself out of the forest. There was nothing else he could do except hope his orders had reached everyone. Just as Turalyon had suspected, the dragons swooped down and opened their mouths, and from those mouths poured fire and devastation. Do something. There's nothing I can do. I wish there was. Then you. You do something. Use your magic. But the old mage shook his head sadly. I'm still exhausted from the storm earlier. You could see the guilt and shame in Khadgar's eyes, but it wasn't his fault. I need to get to Silvermoon. My parents are there. I need to help them. I know. And I understand. But going in there now would only spell your death. My family. My lords. Please tell me they'll be alright. They're powerful magi. They'll shield the city from harm. Even the dragons won't be able to touch them. Thank you. You're right, Turalyon. My death now would accomplish nothing. Turalyon suspected Illyria was trying to convince herself of that, but she then glared at the dragons fluttering in the sky. But there's wood. The entire horde's wood. Especially the orcs. They brought this destruction upon us. I will see them all suffer for it. We all will. Another elf, dressed in full beautiful war gear, approached, and the expression on his face seemed just as angry and vengeful as Illyria's had become. Both the Maltheran one of our finest rangers. And a second elf then approached, female. And this is my sister Sylvanas Windrunner, ranger general and commander of our forces. Sylvanas, Lord Theron, this is the Turalyon of the Silver Hand, second in command of the Alliance forces. And this is Khadgar of Dalaran. Most of my warriors escaped the inferno thanks to you. We cannot breach the flames, however, so we're trapped without, while our families are trapped within. But we cannot linger on such thoughts. We are here. 
and we must do what we can to save our people as quickly as possible. And that means destroying the forces threatening them. Your commander, Lord Lothar, sent word to us once before, asking for our participation in this alliance. My leaders chose not to respond beyond a token show of support. Sylvanas then glanced towards her sister, with a sort of smile on her face. Though some of our rangers took it upon themselves to lend aid to your cause, but my elders realized their error when the trolls and orcs invaded our lands. If Quel'Thalas is not safe from incursion, what is? They ordered me to assemble our warriors and march to meet you, and to render such aid as we could. We would be proud to join your alliance, Sir Turalyon. I hope that our deeds henceforth will compensate for the tardiness of our involvement. Turalyon nodded, and once again wished that Lord Lothar was here now. A champion would know how to handle this situation properly. Thank you. We welcome you and all your kin into our alliance. Together we will drive the Horde from this continent, from your lands and ours that we may afterward live in peace and cooperation once again. Anything else Duralian had planned to say was then interrupted by a squawk from above, and Theron reached for his sword before realising that the descending creature was not a dragon, more like a poor man's chocobo. Sorry, lad. We tried, but dragons are a bit beyond us, I'm afraid. Thank you for your efforts anyway, Kurdren, and for your aid earlier. It saved many lives. Duralian then glanced around at everybody. Khadgar, Illyria, Sylvanas, Lothamar Theron, and Kurdran Wildhammer. Good people. Good lieutenants. You suddenly didn't feel so alone or self-conscious anymore. Perhaps with these people by his side, he could be a good leader. At least until Lothar returned, anyway. We need to get our people out of here. We will return and free Quelth the last from the Horde, but right now we need to regroup and wait. I suspect the Horde isn't going to remain here for long. They have some other goal in mind. No idea what, but still. They'd taken the forest driven the elves from their home, attacked Airy Peak, crushed Kazmadan. Where would they strike next? Where would he strike next if he were handling their campaign? What was the single biggest remaining threat? And then it hit him. Capital City. It made sense. From Silvermoon, the orcs could march over the mountains and directly into Lordaeron. The city had few defenders left, as most were already with the Alliance. Fortunately, marching over the mountains would mean making their way across Alterac first, Perinold was a bit of a douche, but surely he'd rally his forces against an invasion of his own lands, right? Hmm? Let's go. Get your gear and get moving. Doomhammer Mama watched his warriors for a moment, but then turned round to see Gul'dan staring at him like a weirdo. What? My clan and I will remain here for a time. I have other plans for the Altars of Storms. Plans that will aid the Horde in its conquest. Doomhammer Mama frowned. He didn't trust this little ugly dickhead. But he couldn't deny that the two-headed ogres had proven immensely useful. Yes, those bloody dwarves and their griffins had handled them pretty easily, but without the ogres, the Horde may not have been able to break the Alliance's lines, which had given them a small window to regroup at a crucial moment. Do what you must, but don't take long. We'll need every advantage if we want to conquer Lordaeron quickly. I will not delay. There was a weird grin on Gul'dan's face that troubled Doomhammer a little bit, but... Zuluhead then came running up to give a report. We cannot breach their defences. Even the dragons can do nothing. Their fire watches over the city but does not touch it, and their claws are repelled by some invisible barrier. The sun will. The elven source of magic. Of course Gul'dan would know of such a thing, Doomhammer thought. Is there a way to destroy it? Or drain it? Tap it for ourselves? I've tried. I can feel its power, but it is of a kind unfamiliar to me. I suspect only the elves can gain its power, for it is tied to them in this land. Can you use the altars to break their defences? Again, Gul'dan grinned. That is one of the things I'm attempting. The altars were crafted from the elves' own rune stones, which were originally powered by the Sunwell. I may be able to use that link in reverse, sending my own magic into their power source and either destroying it, or wresting it away from them. Doomhammer disliked the idea of placing such potency in Gul'dan's hands, but it was better than leaving it to the elves. Do what you can, but breaching the city is secondary. We can't get in, but they can't get out either. The Warchief then turned his attention to Zuluhead. Same goes for your dragons. We may need them, a capital city. If you've not managed to break their barrier after a few more days, leave it. And come join the rest of the Horde, and make sure that little warlock bastard joins you. <laughs> if necessary, I'll order a dragon to snap him up and carry him in its belly. And with that, 
Doomhammer buggered off to make sure his own Blackrock warriors were ready to set out towards their next target. A few hours later, the Horde marched. Gul'dan and Cho'Gul watched them leave, waving goodbye like a couple of grandparents or something. But as soon as the last orc disappeared from sight, Gul'dan turned to his two-headed buddy. Are we ready? Ready. Good. Tell your warriors we march at once. It's a long way back to South Shore. Zuluhid is occupied with that elven city. He won't even notice we've gone until it's too late. What if he sends his dragons after us? He won't. He wouldn't dare do so without Doomhammer's orders. And that means first sending a messenger to the rest of the Horde, and then waiting for a reply. We'll be well beyond their reach by then. And Doomhammer won't be able to spare any of his remaining troops to come after us. Not if he wants to take that human city. Gordon then giggled to himself. For weeks, he'd been trying to figure out a way to break free of the Warchief. Pursue his own agenda. And now, Doomhammer had basically handed him the perfect solution. He'd fully expected the bloke to deny his request to stay behind. But no. He allowed it, like some kind of moron. Meanwhile, Doomhammer crept along a narrow trail. It was night, and his people were sleeping. But he had urgent business to attend to. So he continued silently, until he reached a valley. And in that valley, awaited a cloaked figure. Hello? I'm here. You speak common. I know your tongue. You. You sent that message. I did. I thought it might be best if we met. Before any unpleasantness occurred. Very well. Do you remember glanced around to make sure this man hadn't brought assassins? But there didn't appear to be any. I'd not expected a human to contact me. Especially in such a manner. Is that how your people communicate? With trained birds? It is one method. I knew none of my people would be able to get close enough to convey a message to you. So I sent the bird. Did you kill it? <laughs> we didn't realize it was a messenger until we found the parchment on its leg. By then it was too late. Hope you didn't want it back. It was only a bird. I'm more interested in preventing a much larger number of regrettable deaths. So your message said, what do you want from me? Assurances. Of what? I want your word, as a warrior and a leader, that you will keep your warriors in check. No killing, raiding, raising or other atrocities here in the mountains. Leave my cities and villages intact, and do not hound or hunt my people. Doomhammer considered this. And what do we get in return? Free passage. Oh? You and your warriors seek to cross the mountains and invade Lordaeron. These peaks are treacherous. Your horde might suffer heavy losses and be weakened before you even reach your goal. I can show you which paths to take. You'd be able to pass through the mountains quickly and unopposed. So you clear the way for us. We leave your lands unharmed in return. That is correct. Doomhammer stepped forward until he was no more than about two feet away from the cloaked man. This close, he could make out some of the bloke's features. Guy kind of weirdly reminded him of Gul'dan in a way, with his narrow, calculating shit face. Very well. Show me the quickest path through these mountains and I will lead my warriors through at speed without stopping for plunder. When we conquer this land, I shall place my protection around these mountains. You and yours shall be safe. Excellent. I knew you'd be reasonable. Here's a map of the area. This here valley is marked to help orient you. Right. Okay then. Well, I'll uh, just be off. After a few awkward moments, the guy finally turned his back and walked off. And Doomhammer considered the situation. One quick blow is all it would take. Guy had already handed over the map like an idiot. But that would be dishonorable. If there was one thing Doomhammer wanted more than anything else, it was to restore his race's pride and purity. They were more than just bloodthirsty savages. Sometime later, Perinald stood in his Alterac throne room, or whatever you want to call it, when a general and several officers entered. You summoned us, your majesty. Yes, come in. I've just received some new information about the Horde and its movements. I wish to share it with you. The general and officers exchanged quick glances. They'd not heard anything. I have it under good authority that the Horde is indeed heading towards us. They apparently plan to invade Lordaeron, and have chosen to cross the mountains in order to reach it. How far away are they? Perinald raised a hand to hush the murmurs. That is not our concern. Not our concern, your majesty, but we're part of the Alliance. I have reconsidered our options, and decided to realign ourselves in this conflict. Alterac is no longer part of the Alliance, effective immediately. You what, mate? 
I have formed a non-aggression treaty with the Horde. We will not hinder their progress through the mountains, and in return they will leave Alterac unharmed and untouched. So you would have us conspire with the Orcs, Your Majesty. At that, Perinald lost his composure a little bit. Yes, General. I would have us conspire with them. Because I would have us survive. Do you have any idea what we're facing? The Horde. The entire Horde. Tens of thousands. Marching through our home. And do you have any idea what these Orcs are like? I've seen one. No farther away from me than you are now. He was enormous. Carrying a hammer, it would take three men to lift. And he was waving it about as if it was a child's toy. They'll kill us all. Don't you understand? But the Alliance... I'll piss on the Alliance. Where are they now? Not here. They've abandoned us, don't you see? It is every kingdom for itself now. The other kings would do the same. Can we... Can we trust them? We have no choice. They can crush us with barely a thought. But if they hold to their word, Alterac will survive. I... I don't like this. We gave the other nations our word. You don't have to like it. You only have to obey. I am your king, after all, and I've made my decision. You've all sworn oaths to me, and you will abide by them. The general and officers all stood silently for a moment, until finally, as you say, your majesty, I will obey. Good. And, um, as for the alliance, I will accept any and all consequences personally. Now, as shown on this map, the Horde will march through these southern paths. We merely need to leave them unmanned. Looks like they're planning to strike Lorder on from the north. Wouldn't take that approach myself, but then I don't have their numbers. Or their arrogance. The general then glanced back up at Perinald, his expression still pretty dubious, despite his previous pledge of allegiance. The men may object, your majesty. See, this is a betrayal of their oaths. If they revolt, we won't be able to stop them. Then tell the men that the Horde will be marching through the northern passes. That'll keep them occupied and safely out the way. I'll station them at once, your majesty. Great. Get a move on. We don't want to risk the orcs arriving whilst our troops are still in the way. The officers saluted and began to pile out the room, but the general did not. He stayed. Something else, general. There's been a messenger, sire, from the Alliance. He arrived whilst you were... He's waiting outside, sire. Well, send him in at once. A young man then entered the room, looking very nervous. Your majesty... I bring you greetings and a message from Lord Anduin Lothar. Perinald dismissed the general and then walked up to the young man and gestured for him to continue. He says you're to bring your troops to Lordaeron. The Horde is likely to attack and your forces must aid in its defence. I see. Does he expect you to report back? The Lion's messenger nodded. Shame. Perinald then pulled a dagger and stabbed the young messenger, who fell to the ground and died pretty quickly. Rest in peace, the Lion's messenger. It would have been far better if the message had been a written one. Another meanwhile, a dragonmore orc named Braddock was currently soaring high in the sky, atop a red dragon, and it was the best bloody day of his life. He'd never known true happiness, not until he became a dragon rider for his clan. It was the best. His chieftain had had a bit of a hunch, and had sent him down to South Shore just to check on something. And that hunch was now seemingly being proven correct, because the ships were being prepped for departure and they were not supposed to be doing that. Balak pulled on his reins and ascended, and as he got closer, he saw a familiar face. It was Gul'dan, the warlock. Balak didn't like him very much. No one did. But he was a dragon rider now. What could he possibly have to be afraid of? Why are you taking the boats? Turn them around. The horde's in Lordaeron, not across the sea. Gul'dan paid Braddock no mind, seemingly just ignoring him completely. So Braddock descended even further and yelled, I said! Suddenly, Gul'dan's hand shot upward, and Braddock felt immense pain shoot through his chest. Then the world went dark, and then the Braddock went dead. Rest in peace, Braddock. And a final meanwhile, the passes in the mountains were utterly deserted, as promised. And Doomhammer led his warriors through them quickly, just as he'd promised. It only took them two days to cross the whole bunch of the mountains. And in that time, the orcs did not see a single human. Not a one. In fact, some of the warriors were actually grumbling about how bloody boring it had been. But their boredom wouldn't last much longer, because now Doomhammer and his army were in eyesight of a majestic walled city. This is it, boys. Capital city. Onwards, warriors. Let's bring the fight to them while our war cry still echoes in their ears. Sire. Sire. 
The orcs are coming. What? Here? Yes, sire. King Terranis could see just how pale and scared his guard commander Morev looked. He was a seasoned veteran, and yet he looked absolutely bloody terrified. They must have come across the mountains. They're pouring onto the far side of the lake even as we speak. Terranus then brushed past the commander and strode out of his throne room, with Morev following closely behind, probably wondering where the hell they were going. They made their way up some stairs, entered the Queen's drawing room. Leanne was in there, as was the Princess Kalia, and both of them looked a bit surprised to see Terranus at this time of day. I was supposed to be at work. But the King stepped past them, and out onto a balcony that overlooked Lordamir Lake, and then stopped, stunned. There they were. The Horde had indeed arrived. How did this happen? Why did Perinod not stop them cold? They must have overwhelmed him. A competent troop could have held the Horde back, but not if they were following incompetent orders. Terranus frowned and shook his head. Perinod was indeed a selfish scheming dumbass that would probably issue incompetent orders, but Hath, the Alterac general, was a good man, a solid warrior. He would have assembled a solid defense. Send messages to Alterac, and to the Alliance army as well. Let them know our situation. We'll find out what happened later. But first things first. Rally the guards, sound the alarm, get everyone inside the gates. We don't have much time. Sometime later, pigeons were sent out to other Alliance leaders as well as the last known location of the Alliance army. And one of those pigeons flew straight to Stromgard. And its message had just been relayed to Thoris Trollbane. What? Thoris had been drinking, so he was especially pissed off by this news. That fool! What did he do? He let him through, didn't he? Thoris despised Perinald, not just because they were neighbours, and so there was a bit of rivalry. He just straight up didn't like the bloke personally. He was a creep, oily, sniffed his own farts. But even an arrogant prick like Perinald should have been able to block an invading army. Maybe not stop them completely, but at least slow them down. Damn him. He should have held them. He should have warned us. Suddenly, a thought struck Thoris, right in the brain. Perinald had never been that enthusiastic about the Alliance. Him and Greymane had been the only two to resist, but the Alterac leader had disliked the idea of combat completely, even suggesting they try negotiating first. Oh, you traitorous little fool. You made a deal with them, didn't you? You flaccid penis. Thoris kicked a chair and turned to one of his guards. Assemble the troops. We're going to Alterac. Sire, we've already sent out half our troops to the Alliance army. We'll grab everyone you can find. For what, sire? Are we lending them aid? <laughs> yeah, in a manner of speaking. Meanwhile, Lothar was currently stood with a bunch of other soldiers surrounded by orc corpses. It had been pretty much non-stop battles for him and his half of the Alliance forces that had stayed behind. This was a very rare and very appreciated opportunity for them to catch their breath for the first time in a while. How many of these things are there? Too many, but fewer now, eh? Lothar grinned and the men smiled back at him. But that little moment was interrupted by some rustling in the bushes, followed by a figure bursting out upon them. But luckily, it was just a blow. Messages, sir. Thanks. Maybe don't jump out of bushes on armed soldiers, lad. Lothar then studied the message, and his jaw tightened. What is it, sir? The Horde. They've made their way to Lordaeron. They're likely attacking the capital this very moment. Well, what do we do? We should set out right away. No. There's too much distance. We never reach it in time. We need to finish our work here. Make sure the orcs left in the hinterlands are dead or driven off. We cannot allow them to retain a foothold here. The soldiers nodded, but they didn't look happy. Not anymore. Lothar could hardly blame them. Jorelian and the rest of the army are already on their way. They will come to the city's aid. And when we're done here, we'll march to capital city and mop up any orcs that are left. Another meanwhile, Thoris Strollbane now stalked across the mountains with his men behind him clearing each of the Ultra passes of orcs as they went. But it wasn't until the fifth pass that Drollbane finally came across human soldiers. Ultrarak soldiers. Hold. State your name and business here. Thoris Trollbane, King of Stromgard. Where is Perinold? He's... He's in his castle. You're trespassing. And the orcs? Are they trespassing? Or are they guests? The orcs won't pass us. We'll defend this pass with our lives. Good. Only they're not at this pass. They're at the far south of here. That startled the soldiers somewhat. But we were stationed here. This is where they said the orcs would be. Well, they're not. Fortunately, my men are now blocking those southern passes. 
but many already made it through to Lordaeron. Where's General Hath? He's at the next pass. I'll take you there. And so he did. After about an hour, they reached the next pass, and the soldier that had accompanied them approached the general and announced their arrival. Your Majesty, General, the orcs were pouring through your southern passes. We blocked them for you. Hath's face paled. Our southern passes? Y you're sure? You're a fine soldier and a good commander, Hath. But you've always been a terrible liar. You knew, didn't you? The general then sighed and nodded. Perinold made some kind of deal with him. Free passage in exchange for protection. And you went along with it. If the Horde conquers Lordaeron, they'll control the entire continent. What made you think you'd be safe? I... I don't know. The leader gave Perinold his word, but I don't know what that's worth. I told Perinold we should abide by our oaths to the other nations, but he countermanded that. I swore fealty to him. I must obey. Plus, I thought he might be right. But what good is the survival of just one kingdom? If we don't have our honour, we've nothing at all. The general's demeanour then changed. He went from defiance to defeat to now somewhat emboldened in the space of about 30 seconds, and then turned to his men. Everyone, we march to the southern passes at top speed. We're going to assist our friends. He then turned back to Thorith. He's in the castle. His personal guard are there, but there's only 20 of them. No, we don't have time to worry about him now. Besides, if I go there, it's an invasion. If you go there, it's treason. We'll let the Alliance settle matters with Perinold later. A goddamn another, meanwhile. Damn it! We're too late! Drellian and his peeps had rode very, very hard, and were now staring at the valley below. The Horde had crossed the lake, and they had capital city absolutely surrounded. They haven't breached the walls. It's not yet too late to aid them. No, you're right. The battle's not lost yet. Hell, we may even have an advantage. They don't know we're here yet. If we could let Terranus know we're here, we could coordinate our attacks. A fine plan, but how would you suggest we reach the city? No one could make it through all of them unharmed. Not even an elf. It would be suicide to attempt it. Khadgar then grinned at the three of them. I can get across. With a little help. Zaya, up there. Terranus looked at where the soldier was pointing and gasped. Ready the archers, but hold fire until my command. There was something a little bit strange about the approaching unidentified flying object. Why would the orcs send a single flyer when there were thousands upon thousands of them smashing against the walls below? They were kind of beyond the point of sending scouts and shit. The shape then got closer, and Terranus could finally see that it was a griffin, with a bloke on its back. Lower your weapons. It's a friendly. Kagar then landed the griffin on the ramparts, let out a sigh of relief and kind of thanked it under his breath, and then turned to face the king. What are you doing here? I come bearing good news. Duralian and his forces are just the other side of the Northern Valley. They will attack the Horde from behind and draw them away from you. That is good news. With the Alliance army here, we can attack them from two fronts and batter them. That's the plan. Kurdran loaned me as Griffin, so I could reach you and coordinate. I'm just glad I still remember how to ride one after. Come. My servants will take care of the Griffin. Tell me what Duralian thinks we should do next. Fucking charge! Duralian and his forces raced down the hill and smashed the horde's back doors in, and as the orcs turned to meet them, catapults and arrows and ballista fired upon them from the city. So for a moment, the orcs looked really annoyed and confused about what the hell they were supposed to do. Faced the Alliance soldiers, the city struck them from behind. Faced the city, the Alliance soldiers struck them from behind. But the horde had huge numbers. They had bodies to spare, so to speak. Some orcs started forcing themselves at the Alliance army, forcing the humans to backpedal. Whilst at the other end, some orcs threw themselves at the city walls and the city gates. The gates! They're starting to give way! I've got them now, Chief. The gates are starting to give way. Doomhammer grinned. Victory was so close he could feel it in his fingers and toes. Once the gates were down, his people could pour into the city, and that would be that. The war would be won, and the orcs could finally start a new life here without all of this fighting and stuff. Doomhammer, look. Orgrim did indeed look. Up in the sky, a dark shape loomed. It was a dragon, so Doomhammer's grin grew even larger. Surely that settled it. However, the dragon rider landed and strode towards the war chief with a facial expression that wasn't as enthusiastic as one would expect. I bring a message, boss, from Zulahed. Spit it out. It's Gul'dan. He's fled. What? When? Shortly after you left. Him, Cho'Gal, the Twilight's Hammer, and Stormreaver clans. 
They launched the boats back into the great sea and are sailing south. One of my clansmen spotted them, and Gul'dan killed him. But I was there. I saw it happen. I wanted to go after them there and then, but I knew that my chieftain and yourself needed to be informed of this treachery. Doomhammer nodded. We did the right thing. Gul'dan probably would have killed you as well, and we'd be none the wiser. Damn him. I knew he couldn't be trusted. And now he's taking the ships. We can fly after him. Zulahed is preparing the other dragon riders as we speak. Leave it to us. We'll burn those ships to ash and every orc on them. Yeah, but only if you can get close enough. Gul'dan's magic is strong. Cho'gul's powerful as well. Thinking of Cho'gul, Doomhammer then came to the sudden realization that Gul'dan had been playing him for quite a while. Oh, f I'll let him transform ogres into new warriors just to fill out his own ranks. The war chief then bit down hard on his lip, punishing himself for his own stupidity. He'd been so excited about the prospect of new weapons for the war, he'd ignored his own instincts. Multiple times. Another orc, Tharbek, from the Blackrock clan itself then approached. Yes, there's a problem. The, uh, the mountains are closed. What? We're no longer able to get through the passes. I sent some scouts back to find out why, but they've not returned. What the hell was happening? Victory had seemed all but assured a few moments ago, and now, not so much. A human betrayed us. I knew one who would sell out his own race couldn't be trusted. Again, he did ignored his instincts. But Doomhammer had also figured that Perinod was too cowardly to turn against them. So the more likely explanation was that the Alliance had discovered Perinod's treachery and removed him from his position of control. That didn't change the result, however. It was shit either way. How many orcs are trapped up there? Impossible to say. I'd say at least half the clan if I were to guess. But well, we still have plenty of warriors. And once Gul'dan and the others arrive, they're not coming. Gul'dan has betrayed us. He's taken the ships. But why? If we lose this war, we'll all be without a home. Him included. Doomhammer then shook his head. This war was never his priority. Even back at Stormwind, he said he'd found something else. Something powerful. Something that would make him strong enough to not need the Horde for protection. So what do we do? In all honesty, Warchief, I don't think we have enough warriors to take the city. Doomhammer didn't say anything, but he knew Tharbek was right. The attack from behind had taken them by surprise, and reduced their numbers by a large proportion. And now, they could no longer expect reinforcements from any direction. But, losing this battle was not the thing that weighed heaviest on the Warchief. Not anymore. Gul'dan and his followers were setting their goals above those of the Horde. Their own selfish desires above the needs of their people. This was the exact reason why Doomhammer had killed Blackhand in the first place. This could not be allowed to stand. Rent! Hey! The two Blackhand brothers approached, looking a little bit confused as to why they'd been summoned. Take your black tooth grin south, through Hillsbrad to the sea. Gul'dan has fled, but it was only him and two clans, so they wouldn't have needed all the boats. Go. Pursue the traitors. Destroy every last one of them. But the city? The war? Damn it, Rend! Our people's honour is at stake! <sighs> Consider this a chance to regain yours. I will lead my clan south more slowly, blocking the Alliance from following you. But we will keep this route open, all the way back to this city. We will return here afterwards, and finish what we started. His voice sounded confident, but even Doomhammer had his doubts about that last part. They'd caught the city by surprise this time. That probably wouldn't happen again. But the Blackhand boys nodded. As you say. Doomhammer then turned back to the original Dragon Rider, who had been waiting very patiently this entire time. Tell Zulu Head to send all the dragons. All of them. Fly as fast as you can. You will have your chance to avenge your clanmate's death. The Dragon Rider nodded, grinned, and then buggered off, as did the others leaving Doomhammer alone, shaking with shock and rage. And for some reason, Terran Gorfiend then walked up. What of you then, rotting corpse? You followed Gul'dan once. He's betrayed us all. Will you run to him now? Gul'dan has forsaken our people. The Horde is all. It retains our loyalty. As to you, for as long as you lead it. Well, that was nice. Doomhammer was actually a little bit taken aback by the creature's response. All right then. Go and protect our people as they retreat from the city. Gorfiend then stalked off, so Doomhammer was alone yet again. But that didn't stop him from talking to himself and doing a little dramatic monologue. You'll die for this, Gul'dan. Meanwhile, Gul'dan stood on deck and sniffed the sea air. 
closed his eyes and allowed his mystical senses dominance. Aha! There. The feeling hit him so strong, he could taste it. Stop. We are here. But we're in the middle of nowhere. Oh, should we weigh you with chains and send you down to the depths to check? Or would you prefer to sit here and trust that I know what I'm doing? The orc stammered and backed away very quickly, and Gul'dan then turned to Cho'Gul. Inform the others. We will begin at once. So, the two-headed ogre did indeed inform the others, and soon enough, a whole bunch of ogre magi and orc necromancers were stood around eagerly, waiting to hear what the next step was. The place we seek, an ancient temple, lies below us, and as much as I'm sure we'd all love to swim down there, in the cold and the dark, we shall instead raise the land itself and bring the temple to the surface. Is that even possible? Yes. I once guided the Shadow Council to raise an entire volcano back on our homeworld, and I will guide you all now. And so he did, and after a whole bunch of arms being waved about, serious concentration faces, and what I'm sure was a fantastic spectacle to behold, several entire islands were raised from the depths of the ocean. I see them! Over there! Ren Blackan looked to where the Orc Warrior was pointing. Good. Increase speed. I want to reach them before they have a chance to disappear into some hideout. Ren then glanced around and saw a number of the younger warriors looking a little bit nervous. Their magic is potent. Gul'dan could easily kill three or four of us within minutes. But they need those minutes. So just steer clear of the warlocks until there's an opening. They may be powerful, but they're still orcs. They can still bleed and die. We're not alone. Damn him. Why did he always have to be so quick at making decisions? Ugh. Well, there's nothing for it. Tell the warriors to prepare for battle. You will need to fend them off while I enter the temple and find the tomb. With pleasure. Death to the traitors! The two forces slammed into each other with thunderous impact. Jogor's warriors fought savagely, their only goal to inflict as much damage and pain as possible, whilst the Horde's forces fought for revenge and justice. But there was one difference between the two sides. Numbers. Gul'dan only had two clans following him, and one of them, the Storm Reavers, had accompanied him into the temple. So it was basically just the Twilight's Hammer versus one of the largest clans within the Horde. Well, that was easier than expected. Yeah, I thought that was going to be a little bit more epic. That's still Gul'dan. That asshole has much to answer for. Quickly, you fools. Fan out and search for the primary passageway. We must reach the Chamber of the Eye before the tomb's guardians awaken. Guardians? You didn't say anything about guardians. Gul'dan then slapped the cowering warlock. Spineless coward! Move! Gul'dan's rage mobilised the Storm Reavers. His wrath was the more immediate threat, no matter how bloody spooky this temple was. So they got to searching, until eventually, one of the warlocks called to Gul'dan after discovering a wide corridor, full of fine carvings and engravings, and mosaics and stuff. Even with all the erosion, you could tell how beautiful this building had once been. But Gul'dan didn't give a shit. All he cared about was what lay at the end. A big door to a big vault. Now, Sark Aerith, I will claim whatever's left of your power and bring this wretched world to its knees. Gul'dan could feel the energy and power beyond the door. It was arousing. So he motioned the others to get back, reached out and grappled the handle. However, it was kind of stiff. Hadn't been used for centuries. He then gave it a real good yank, only to feel a prickle of a spell wash over him. But the spell did nothing. Didn't hurt at all. Just as Sargeras had said, Aegwyn had warded this vault against intrusion. But those wards were designed only for those native to this world, not orcs. So Gul'dan yanked the handle again, heard a click, and then boof, the vault was wide open. But before Gul'dan could feel really pleased with himself and chuckle about how shit Aegwyn was, something stirred in the darkness within the vault. No. Gul'dan tried to scream, but he was paralysed with fear. This was not how it was supposed to happen. Sargeras promised. Gul'dan tried to summon his magic, tried to do anything, but the mere sight of these creatures approaching scared the shit out of him. Damn you, Sargeras. I won't be beaten like this. I am Gul'dan. I am darkness incarnate. It will not end like- <laughs> Main Blackhand moved to step through the temple's entrance, only for Rend to stop him. What? We still need to get Gul'dan. Did you not hear those screams and that evil laugh? I don't think Gul'dan's a threat anymore. 
And I certainly don't feel the need to go in there. So, what do we do now, then? Return to Doomhammer. We still have a war to fight. And so, the two brothers and their black tooth grin followers return to their boats and buggered off. Are we ready? Aye, sir. Good. Sound for positions. We attack as soon as they fall within range. The quartermaster saluted and walked off towards the big brass bell that sounds for positions and stuff. And immediately, Dalin Proudmoor heard the hustle and bustle of his crew rushing to their assigned stations. Good folks, each and every one of them. He never sailed with a finer group, although he'd never say that out loud to them. Proudmoor then turned his attention back to the sea. The dark shapes he'd spotted on the horizon were bigger now, and they were exactly what he'd suspected them to be. Orc ships. This was it. He'd been dreaming of this chance ever since the war had started. He didn't give a shit where they'd been. He didn't care why there were orc ships out in the Great Sea, separate from all the fighting going on at Lordaeron. Wouldn't matter soon anyway, because Proudmoor intended to see the orc fleet sunk as quickly and efficiently as possible. And so, just behind the island of Crestfall, northeast of Proudmoor's beloved Cold Tirith, the entire Cold Tiran fleet waited and prepared and stuff. Fire! Somehow, the Cold Tiran fleet took the orc ships completely by surprise, so the initial volley of cannon fire hit hard and sank a whole bunch of the buggers. This was going to be over well quickly, Dalin thought. The orcs aren't mariners, after all. They may be strong on the ground, but in a boat they're a bunch of morons. However, a lookout then shouted down from the crow's nest, interrupting Dalin's moment of self-congratulation. Admiral, there's something heading towards us, from above. Meanwhile, on one of the other boats, what was that? Jarrah, use your words, man. Did you see something? Derek Proudmoor's pilot continued to stammer and shake with fear. The words just weren't coming out. So he pointed instead. And Derek turned to find out what was what. And then he saw it. Up in the clouds was a dragon, its scales gleaming blood red in the early morning light. And it wasn't alone. There were two. No. Three. No. There was at least a dozen of the beasts, and they appeared to be diving in this very direction. For a second, Derek swore he saw plain anguish deep within the lead dragon's eyes, like they felt really bad about what they were about to do or something, which was a bit weird, but it didn't provide any kind of solace, because the next thing Derek Proudmore knew, he was on fire, and then he was dead. Rest in peace, Derek. Actually, no. You know what? I'm glad he's dead. Fuck you, Derek. Fucking Derek. All Derek's father, Dalin, could do was watch, as all six ships of the Third Fleet went up in flames. There was definitely no surviving that, and Dalin was absolutely distraught. But grief would have to come later. Turn us around. We continue the attack. But, but the dragons. They're foes like any other. Target them like we would enemy ships. Dalin's men nodded and rushed back to their stations. Sails were filled. Cannons were reloaded and aimed upwards, obviously and crossbows were also loaded. So when one of the dragons started to soar towards them, Proudmore raised his sword high and yelled, Attack! Unfortunately though, their valiant effort failed miserably. The dragon simply dodged every cannonball that flew towards it, and simply ignored the crossbow bolts as they bounced harmlessly off its scales. Because the difference between attacking enemy ships and attacking dragons is, ships can't think for themselves. However, just as Proudmore started to consider the possibility that this might be his final battle, he and his men saw a bunch of new shapes appear in the sky. Smaller than dragons. Wild hammers! Attack! An attack they did. Kurdrin himself launched his storm hammer and knocked a dragon rider off his mount, whilst the rest of the wild hammers did similar things. We'll handle these beasties. You take care of the ships. All right then. Didn't have to tell Dalin twice. They would indeed take care of the ships. The rest of the battle didn't exactly go completely smoothly. The Alliance did lose a few more ships and a few wild hammers, but eventually the Alliance were victorious. Sir, what is it? Dalin looked over the railing at where his mate was pointing. There was someone bobbing in the water. Someone human. Get a rope to him and keep an eye out for other survivors. Dalin's heart raced as the man was hauled aboard. Could it be? Was it Derek? Nope. The man was not wearing the green tunic of Cold Tirith. He was wearing the waterlogged garb of Alderac. What the bloody hell was one of Perinold's men doing floating out here in the ocean? Speak. Lord Perinold... <coughs> sent us. We guided them to their ships. So you're a traitor then. 
I should gut you like a fish and toss your innards to the sea. But such a death is too good for you. Alive, you can provide proof of Perinald's treachery. Dalen then turned to one of his men. Bind him. Toss him in the brig. Yes, sir. Set sail for South Shore. We'll rejoin the Alliance army. Report our success. And Ulthrak's betrayal. They're not coming. What do you mean? The rest of the Horde. They're not coming. Tharbeck looked at his war chief, still obviously requiring a little bit more elaboration. You sent them all the way down to the Great Sea. It will take them days to return. They have dragons, you fool. The dragon riders would have been back by now. Something's happened. The fleet is gone, and the bulk of our force is with it. Tharbeck nodded, but said nothing. But Orgrim knew what he was thinking, something along the lines of, well, if you hadn't have sent them after Gul'dan in the first place, this wouldn't be an issue, would it? And that made Doomhammer grind his teeth a little bit. None of the other orcs had understood his decision. Ever since he'd ordered them to retreat from Capital City, every orc he'd come across had given him stink eye. The gates were starting to give way. The Alliance forces had been pushed back. They'd almost bloody won, as far as all were concerned. So why the bloody hell had Orgrim sent one of the largest clans away and sounded for retreat? But the truth was, he had no choice. As soon as the Blacktooth Grin clan departed, the humans that had been pushed back rushed forward again, just as he'd suspected. And with no reinforcements coming, the Horde needed to retreat. It was the smart thing to do. And the reason he'd sent the Blacktooth Grin clan away in the first place was because, well, they'd been betrayed. And that couldn't stand. Orgrim had vowed to fight corruption, bloodlust, savagery. Without honour, they were mere animals. To allow Gul'dan to escape unpunished was to allow selfishness and the further degradation of their entire race. Or something. I did my best, Orgrim thought. We might lose to the humans, but we will do so proudly. On our feet, with weapons in our hands, not howling and snivelling. Anywho, rather than going southwest, the Horde retreated southeast instead, towards Kazmadan. Doomhammer had left Kilrog Deadeye and his bleeding Hollow clan there, after the Horde had conquered that region, to oversee mining operations. Reuniting with them would mean the Horde would have a bit more of a substantial force again. Then they could turn round and smash the pursuing alliance, and then go from there, as long as nothing else went horribly wrong. Humans, to the east of us. Doomhammer stared at the scout. East, are you sure? Orgrim already knew the scout wasn't lying, or mistaken. He was just kind of wondering how the bloody hell the Alliance were already east of them. And then he remembered. Our oh, balls. The Hinterlands. He'd left some of his forces there to distract the humans whilst they marched towards Quel'Thalas. It had seemed like a great idea at the time, but now it was seemingly biting them in the ass. How many? Hundreds. Maybe more. Orgrim grimaced and turned to Tharbeck. Quicken the pace. Full run, no breaks. We need to reach Kazma down as soon as possible. A short time later, Hail Doomhammer! The Bleeding Hollow welcomes you back to Kazmadan. My thanks. Where are Kilrog and the rest? We've made camp back within the mountains proper. I'll run and tell of your approach. The scout glanced behind Orgrim and looked a little bit confused. Where's the rest of the horde? Dead, most of them. We have Alliance forces marching fast behind us. Tell Kilrog to ready his warriors for battle. The scout seemed like they were about to ask another question, but then thought better of it. Instead, they buggered off to relay the new orders and stuff. Some more time later, We cannot fight them. Not with our full force. Why not? The dwarves. The dwarves? We already crushed their armies. Not all of them. We didn't take Iron Forge. And we've still not been able to crack it. Then leave it. Right now, it's not important. We have to turn on the humans before they crush us. Once we've taken care of the humans, we'll all fall on Iron Forge and rip it open together. But... Kilrog just kind of shook his head. The dwarves are too fierce to leave at our backs. I've been fighting them these past few months and I'll tell you, they're bloody maniacs. If we do not guard that place, we'll face two armies, not one. Doomhammer started to pace and consider that information. He trusted Kilrog's judgement, but they definitely didn't have enough warriors as things stood to face the Alliance. They needed to keep moving. Fine. Stay here. Keep as many warriors as you need to hold the dwarves and defend yourselves. We'll keep going to Blackrock Spire. Make our stand from within the fortress. If you get a chance, join us there. Attack the humans from behind. This is it, Gilrog. This may be our final battle. Gilrog nodded and eyed the Horde Warchief. You made the right choice, Orgrim. 
Gul'dan would have taken us back to the days before the portal opened, with the rage and the hunger and desperation. Whatever happens, you gave our people back their honor. Drellian! Drellian glanced up, all excited and stuff. He recognized that voice. Twas Lothar. Good to see you, lad. I said I'd find you here. They, the elves, I ran across Illyria and Theron as I made my way north. They told me what happened at Capital City, and that you brought the rest of the army this way, chasing after the rest of the Horde. Good job, man. I had a lot of help. To be honest, I'm not entirely sure what happened. Drelian then briefly informed Lothar of the battle outside Capital City, how things had looked pretty grim until the Horde suddenly cheesed it, for seemingly no reason, and he told of the report he'd received from Admiral Proudmoore. And we've been chasing them ever since. Did you hear about Perinod? Yeah. How a man could turn against his own race, Allah, I'll never understand. But thanks to Trollbane, we don't have to worry about Alterac no more. What about the Hinterlands? Orc free? It took us a while to find all of them. Some were burrowed pretty deep, carved themselves out little homes. But we got them in the end. The Wild Elmers are still patrolling to make sure, of course. The Elves are headed back home as well, to clear out Quel'Thalas. The Orcs seem to have left, but the Trolls may still be hiding up there. Wouldn't want to be them when the Rangers arrive. Hey, where's Uther? And the other Paladins? I sent them up to Lord Rom. They'll make sure that region's safe again, and then they'll follow after us. Uther would probably be upset if he misses any more big battles. Drallion nodded. His fellow Paladin probably would be upset, especially since it was really starting to feel like this war was finally coming to an end. The Horde were now small and desperate. Oh, hey, Lothar. Long time no see. So, what are we thinking? Orcs are going to try and hole up here in Kazmadan? No. They'd have the Dwarves to reckon with if they did that. Iron Forge still remains unconquered. The Dwarves will be twitching for a chance to reclaim their mountains. And strike back at the Orcs. Then we should give them that chance. Both Lothar and Khadgar turned to Duralian. Let's go to Ironforge. Use the Griffin Riders to keep tabs on the Horde's path. We free the Dwarves. And then they'll hold the mountains. Prevent the Horde from coming back this way. That's a good plan. Let's do it. Let the troops know. We'll begin our march in the morning. But for now, I need some bloody sleep. I'm getting too old for this shit. However, Lothar gave Turalyon one final glance before retiring for the night. You've handled yourself and the troops well, lad, as I knew you would. Lane, you remind me of him. You have his courage. And then Lothar buggered off, and Turalyon kind of stood there in silence, a little bit stunned. Looks like you've won his respect after all. Shut up. The following day, the Alliance forces reached the colossal doors of Ironforge and found a whole bunch of orcs pounding against them. Don't let up! Drive them back against the rocks! After a short while of fighting, and just as Lothar had hoped, the doors to the Dwarven Kingdom swung open, and an army of angry dwarves poured out, with hammers and axes and boomsticks and stuff. And with their assistance, the battle was over pretty fast. Our thanks, I'm Muradin Bronzebeard, brother to King Magni. The dwarves of Ironforge are in your debt. No problem. Anduin Lothar, commander of the Alliance. We were happy to help. Our goal is to rid all lands of the Horde and their influence. Aye, as it should be. Alliance, you say? It was you who sent the missives to us months ago. From Lordaeron. Indeed. Lothar realised Terranus must have sent messengers here, as well as Quel'Thalas. The King of Lordaeron really had left no potential ally untouched. We banded together for this common cause. Whither are you bound now? A second dwarf approached. His face was a lot less wrinkly than Moradin's, but he shared similar features. This is my other brother, Bran. Well, we're following the remainder of the Horde. Many of them have already fallen to us. We're seeking to finish the job and end this war. The brothers looked at each other and nodded. Count us in. Many of our kin will remain here, in the mountains to reclaim our ancestral strongholds and clear Kazmadan. But we'll bring some lads and join their alliance. Make sure these orcs didn't trouble us again. We welcome the help. Lothar had met these kind of dwarves once or twice before, back in Stormwind. If these bronze beards were as good in combat as their wild hammer cousins, they'd be a valuable addition indeed. Good. We'll send someone to inform our brother. He'll catch up with us with supplies. Which way did the horde go? Lothar then glanced to Khadgar, who just kind of shrugged and pointed south. A short time later, Lothar, Turalyon, Khadgar and the rest were all sat around a campfire when Kurd and Wildhammer returned from a bit of scouting. They'd be heading to Blackrock Spire. Blackrock. 
You sure? Dralian had noticed that the bronze beards and wild hammers didn't seem to get along amazingly well. They didn't hate each other. More like quarrelsome siblings. Of course I'm sure. I followed him, didn't I? Maybe you'd like to borrow some griffins and see for yourself. Gudrun chuckled to himself as the bronze beards backed away a little bit. He knew full well that bronze beard dwarves were about as fond of flying as wild hammers were of going underground. Like rock spire. It's a strong position. Good vantage all around. Solid fortifications. Easy to defend. Whoever their leader is, he knows what he's doing. This isn't going to be easy. Aye. And he'd be cursed as well. The rest of the dwarves present all nodded. Our dark iron cousins. What? They built that fortress. But something far darker lives there now. Beneath the surface. Well, if there's something else there, it hasn't disturbed the orcs. They'll fall back there and getting past their defences is going to be a problem. But we can do it. We have the numbers. And the skill. Lothar smiled at his lieutenant. Yeah, it'll be a challenge. But anything worth doing usually is. Lothar was about to say something else when he was interrupted by the sound of plate mail creaking. And then, a bloke stepped towards them. Ufa, my lord. We came as soon as we could. So the Lord runs clean then? It is. My fellows and I made sure of it. Excellent. You've arrived just in time, mate. We just learned the orc's final position. We'll be there within... Five days, provided they've left no surprises along the way. If you're going to Black Rock, we'll be going with you. We'll not leave you to face that lot alone. The Wild Hammers will stay with you as well. Altogether, we outnumber them. Though not by a large margin. I don't need a large margin. Just a fair fight. Five days, then. In five days, we finish this. The humans are here. Doomhammer glanced up at Tharbeck, a little bit annoyed at the fear he heard in his second's voice. When did this sub-chieftain become such a wet lettuce? I know they're here. From up on this ledge, carved into the mountaintop, Doomhammer could quite clearly see the humans. And his own forces. Or what was left of them, anyway. What do we do? We don't have the numbers to repel them. Not anymore. Doomhammer glared at Tharbeck so fiercely the sub-chieftain kinda pooed himself and backed away. What do we do? We fight! The war chief then turned back towards the ledge to address his peeps. Hear me! However, not all of them turned to look at him, which kind of pissed him off a little bit. So he struck the cliff face with his hammer and tried again. Hear me! I know that we have suffered defeats and setbacks. I know Gul'dan's treachery cost us dearly, but we are orcs. We are the Horde. Our footsteps shall still shake this world. <sighs> Wasn't exactly the most overwhelming response from the crowd, but Doomhammer continued anyway. The humans have followed us to this place. They think us beaten. They think we came here because we're fleeing their might. But they're wrong. We came here because this is our stronghold. Our place of strength. We came here because from here, we can spill forth once more. Make them once more tremble at our name. This time, the cheer was louder. The orcs were now standing and waving their weapons about and stuff. They were getting worked up again. Good. We will not wait for them to come upon us. We will not sit idly and allow them to dictate this battle. We will bring the fight to them, and they will learn to regret ever pursuing us here. And when we crush them, we'll march back over their corpses and once more claim their lands. Doomhammer reveled in the screams and cheers from below for a moment, and then turned back to Tharbeck, who now looked a little bit stunned. Ready the warriors of our clan. My elite guard and I will lead the charge ourselves. The rest of the Horde will follow. Just as Doomhammer had hoped, the Alliance was not prepared for the Horde to rush out and attack first. They'd positioned themselves for a siege, so the charge took them completely by surprise. They've overrun our position, sir. What? But Lothar didn't wait for the random soldier to report on the situation. Instead, he kicked his steed into motion and galloped away, with Trellian and the others following closely behind. Sure enough, as they approached the front lines, they saw battle, and heard battle, and stuff. Uther! The paladin strode forward and nodded. We shall not suffer such beasts to live. Uther then beckoned towards the rest of his silver hand buddies and they raced off, their armor, weapons and shields glowing with their faith. They then slammed into the orc savages and cut them all down pretty quickly. Lothar gave them all a thumbs up and then spurred his horse again, racing to the west. The orcs were smart, he had to give them that. He'd not expected them to attack first. It was supposed to be a long, slow siege but they were now paying the price for their complacency. 
If the orcs were able to weaken enough spots along the humans' lines, they could break through, escape into the mountains, and then it could be months or even years before they could track them all down, giving them the time they needed to regroup and rebuild. But Lothar was not going to let that happen. He burst upon a new battle and studied the situation. It was bigger than the last one, bloody loads of orcs and ogres, and at the centre of them was a big bugger swinging a massive hammer around. Something about him struck Lothar immediately. That's their leader, he thought, and before he knew it, he was urging his horse into the fray directly towards the guy. There, Doomhammer grinned as he studied the large human racing towards him. That's their leader, that is, the one Doomhammer had been hoping to find. Crush this man, crush the entire Alliance army's resolve. Move aside. Blah! Doomhammer stalked forward, his hammer clearing space as he moved, until finally there were no more warriors between them. The man did have one advantage though, he was mounted, so Doomhammer solved that problem immediately. Lothar then immediately lunged at Orgrim, causing Doomhammer to grunt from the impact and start swinging his hammer wildly with rage. But the human leader was still very skilled and spry, even in his older years, dodging and dancing and parrying and all sorts of shiz. Trelian, who was off battling orcs of his own, caught a glimpse of what was happening, and he suddenly found himself filled with all sorts of renewed vigour, as he desperately tried to fight his way towards the two commanders. More blows dropped between Lothar and Doomhammer, with some of them landing, a nasty gash, a heavy blow to the right side, and then... Go Daddy, no! I have conquered, and so shall our foes die, until your world belongs to us! Dralian shoved his way through the crowd, and dropped to his knees beside the dead body of his hero, his mentor, and then his gaze switched to the orc towering above him, and something inside the young paladin stirred. What is it this orc had just said? Until your world belongs to us. Not our world. Not even this world. Your world. Of course. The Dark Portal. Khadgar had mentioned it once or twice. The orcs are not from here. And with that realisation, Torellium was finally able to reconcile his faith with the cold harsh reality of this war. The Holy Light did, in fact, unite everything in this world, because the Orcs don't belong here. Your time here is ended. Torellium was now glowing, so bright that both human and Orc onlookers had to actually shield their eyes. You are not of this world, not of the Holy Light. You do not belong here, so piss off. The Horde War Chief grimaced and backed away a step, which gave Torellian a chance to whisper his final goodbyes to Lothar. Go with the light, my friend. You've earned a place among the Holy. Dralian then rose to his feet, and you, foul creature, you will pay for your crimes against this world and its peoples. Doomhammer knew a threat when he heard one, so he gripped his hammer nice and tight, but Dralian flashed with blinding light, and the Orc Warchief felt his hammer leave his grasp, due to Dralian striking it with Lothar's broken sword. However, rather than follow through on the strike and kill the now unarmed vulnerable leader of the Horde, Dralian turned his blade at the last second, and used it to slap Doomhammer down to his knees instead. You will stand trial for your crimes, in capital city, in chains. The leaders of the Alliance will decide your fate, and there you will acknowledge your full defeat. Dralian then turned from the Horde leader to the rest of the Orcs, but you will not be so lucky. A short while later, the battle was over. Orgrim's defeat had sent the Orcs into a bit of a panic, and Dralian had kind of scared the shit out of them as well. So a lot of them ran away, a number of them surrendered, and any that still had it in them to stand and fight were cut down pretty quickly by the Alliance forces, now led by this young paladin who'd finally found his faith and gained superpowers. A band of them fled south through the Red Ridge Mountains. Good. Form up ranks and pursue them, but not too quickly. Let the unit leaders know we don't want to catch them. We don't? Where is this dark portal that leads back to the Orcs' world? We don't know exactly. Somewhere in the Swamplands. And now that the Horde have suffered an undeniable defeat, where do you think they're going? Back home. Exactly. We'll follow them back to this portal and destroy it once and for all. Khadgar nodded and grinned, and then Uther approached. No orcs left save those who've given themselves into custody. Good work. You've, uh, assumed command then. Suppose I have. If you prefer, we can send a griffin rider to Lordaeron and ask King Terranus. There's no need. You were Lothar's second. You took charge of half the army when we divided the forces. You're the only choice now that Lothar is gone. Khadgar turned towards Uther with a glare, daring him to contradict the statement. However, I, you are our commander. 
We'll follow your lead as we did Lord Lothos. The older paladin then rested a friendly hand on Torellian's shoulder. Happy I was to see your faith finally emerge, my brother. Thank you, Uther, the Lightbringer. For so shall you be known henceforth, in honour of the holy light you brought us this day. Uther bowed, clearly chuffed about his new title and stuff. And then he buggered off. I thought he'd argue for taking control. He doesn't want it. He wants to lead, yeah, but only by example. And you? Do you want to lead us? I still don't feel like I've earned it, but I know Lothar trusted me. I believe in his judgement. Now, let's be after those orcs. It took the Alliance a week to reach the area affectionately referred to as the Swamp of Sorrows. Could have made it there a bit quicker, but the Alliance scouts had kept the orcs in sight and were then reporting back regularly, so the Alliance troops could move at a leisurely pace. But the swamp itself was not exactly a pleasant experience for anyone. It was all stinky and shit, and it took another week in the swamp before they finally reached an area called the Black Morass and were a little bit shocked at what they found. I don't understand. It should all be marsh. Like we've already been through. All stinky and shit. This isn't right. Looks almost igneous. But no fire I know could do this. I've never seen the lake. Unfortunately, I have. But not on this world. Something in Khadgar's expression warned the others not to press him. Do you know what your name means in Dwarven, lad? It means trust. I'm sure you'll tell us when you're ready. Well, whatever it is. Certainly tied to the orcs. Plus, if we look on the bright side, it'd be a lot easier to pursue them across stone than more stinky shit marshland. A few nights later, Khadgar, who had been kind of lost in thought since they discovered the change of scenery, suddenly stood up by the campfire and announced, We have a problem. We've consulted with the other Magi, and we think we know what's caused the ground to change. It's a dark portal. Its very presence is starting to affect our world. Why would the portal cause such an alteration? I'd have to see it to be certain. But my guess is it's linking our world with theirs, somehow melding the two together. And their world is made of this weird stone? Not entirely. Some time ago I had a vision of Dranor. What I saw of it was a bleak place. Little life left there, as if nature itself had been stripped away. I think it might be their magics which taint the land itself. And that taint is spreading through the portal. And every time the orcs use their magic here, it grows worse. All the more reason to destroy it then. Another three days passed before the scouts finally returned to report that the orcs had stopped marching. They've all holed up in a large valley just ahead. There's some kind of gateway at the centre. Fantastic. Tell the men. We attack at once. And so they did. The attack commenced, with Torellian taking out a whole bunch of orcs and making his way right to the bottom steps of the portal itself. You face Rend and Main Blackhand of the Blacktooth Grin Clan. Our father led the horde until that upstart Doomhammer slew him unjustly and the two of us have survived many ordeals. We will rebuild the Horde until it is much larger than ever before, and we will smash you out of existence. Nah, don't think so. Your leader is captured, your army destroyed, your clan's in disarray, and I don't think the Orcs are going to follow a guy with a voice like yours. Do yourselves a favour. Flee back to your own world and never return. However, the two brothers did not flee back to their own world and never return. Instead, they both charged as well as a whole bunch of other orcs. Which was actually all part of the plan and exactly what Torellian had wanted them to do. Khadgar, now! Destroy it! Meanwhile, Khadgar, as well as 11 other magi, were all concentrating real hard on the portal itself, waving their arms about and stuff. But it became apparent pretty quickly that the rift was a little bit too big and a little bit too powerful for them to affect. The physical border of the gate, though, well, that was just stone. And stone can be shattered. So, Khadgar drew upon all of his energies, summoned some lightning or something, closed his eyes, and unleashed it. A few months later, it will be an impressive monument. It will. His sacrifice will always shine as a symbol of loyalty and bravery, even after other traces of this war have vanished. Dralian nodded, his gaze still focused on the statue that was being erected near Blackrock Spire. Regent Lord Anduin Lothar, champion of Stormwind and commander of the Alliance. The war was over. The Alliance had won. The Battle of the Dark Portal had been the last. The remaining Orcs had either ran away or been taken into custody, but no one was quite sure what to do with them. So they'd been put to work, in labour camps and stuff. It was better than slaughtering them. And in other news, King Terranus had also marched his forces into Alterac and declared martial law, deposing the traitorous Perinold and imprisoning him. The remaining Kings had decided that they quite liked this whole Alliance thing, so that was to continue. 
and Torellium was to remain being its commander. You're thinking heavy thoughts again. Only about the future and what it may bring. No one knows the future, though I suspect we've not seen the last of the Horde or their world. I hope you're wrong, but if you're right, we'll be here, waiting for them. This world is ours, and by the holy light, we'll keep it safe now and forever. A noble statement, good Torellium. Perhaps that's what they'll carve on your statue when the time comes. A statue? What could either of us possibly do to earn statues? And we're leaving it there! Thanks very much for watching this whole bloody thing. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to my patrons as well, who are probably being listed on the screen as I say this. If you'd like to read the book itself, there's a link in the description for a place to buy it. And now Hero's gonna talk. Bye bye Thanks to the Flying Buttress for putting this together. Please go check out his channel for prior book retellings, like Arthas, Rise of the Lich King, Rise of the Horde, and The Dawn of the Aspects, which is a good video to watch to catch up on the lore for the upcoming expansion Dragonflight.